Okay, good morning, everybody. This is the August 27th meeting of the Board of Directors of Golden Rain Foundation of Walnut Creek. Roll call, please. Certainly. Kelso? Here. Dumfo? Here. Harrington? Here. Walker? Here. Adams? Here. Anderson? Here. Brown? Here. Flaherty? Here. Kikuchi? Here. O'Keefe? Here. Thank you. Approval of the minutes of July 30th. Anyone have any corrections or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, they're approved as written. Mayor Haskew. Good morning, Council, uh, President Kelso and the board and the view viewers and anybody else um, who watches this later on in all the reproductions of it. Um, my name is Luella Haskew and it is my honor this year to be the mayor of Walnut Creek, challenging though it may be. So I'm thinking that one of the things that people are really interested in is um, wildfires and particularly what's happening in terms of your particular area. First of all, let me assure you that um, the fire department has is on high alert, uh, which you probably realized when apparently there was a small grass fire in your area by a PG&E pole. I will also tell you that um, on Sunday morning, um, there was a condo fire at the Keys, which is right near where I live. And it was scary to hear all the fire engines, especially since they kind of stopped right next to our house, it seemed. Um, but there was a condo fire. Um, it was in a condo in full uh, blaze. Uh, the, the resident was out on the balcony. Uh, the police were there first and, and tried to get everybody evacuated, got everybody evacuated. And uh, then uh, the fire department arrived. Uh, they rescued the resident who was on the balcony just in the nick of time. Uh, they held the fire to just that condo with some smoke damage and some water damage in a couple of the other homes. Uh, but basically, they were there when they were needed. So the fire department in the police department and the people that we will need in an emergency are available. Uh, there are reasons to be um, concerned about evacuation of Rossmore because it is a one exit essentially area. Let me assure you that the city is working, has worked on and continues to improve the plans for evacuation for your area, that um, they have made adjustments and continue to make adjustments for the changes that we have to undergo because of the COVID limitations. Uh, there um, was a, an evacuation drill late last summer at the Lakewood section of Walnut Creek, which is very much like uh, Rossmore. It was, it's, it's narrow. It was essentially a one exit kind of situation um, included in this evacuation ex, um, ex exercise was the uh, fire department, the police department, search, and any other organization, the county, any other organization that was necessary. And um, there were very few kinks in the system. I was an observer uh, and it went relatively well, um, I would say exceptional, and that uh, they what they kinked up, they've unkinked since then. So it, we've had practice. And so of course, be weary, of course, keep your go bags and whatever you need to do to feel confident um, but you need to know that the city and the fire department and the county and CERT are all ready to jump in and help you out if such situation should develop. On another note, uh, during the hottest part of the last couple of weeks, uh, Walnut Creek opened the Tice Gym as a cooling center. So for those who didn't have air conditioning are available or other things. Uh, there was an opportunity to cool down. Um, 
I understand that there may be some misinformation going around about um, our plans, our agreements with our city employees. As you know from prior discussions, the city had to cut uh, about $25 million total from the last year um, in the last quarter from their budget and uh, an additional amount for this coming year. Uh, we had signed agreements with our units, which is city talk for union, union, and they agreed, we agreed in the good days that we could afford a 3% raise. When the disaster, financial disaster happened, um, it became really clear that we were going to have to do some pretty stringent, difficult um, choices. And we asked the city employees um, if they would reopen their contracts to accept a change. Now, the city can't demand this. The only thing, thing that the city could have done to keep our budget under control is to do full formal layoffs in, because of the contracts. We can't, we can't reduce anything in the contract. The contract holds. The only way you can get a reduction of, of the agreement from the employee side is to have them step forward and let us open the, the um, contract. Three of the units did, um, and they took, instead of their 3% raise, they took in except, uh, eight days approximately in furloughs. That savings allowed us to prevent 15 approximate layoffs. So their sacrifice not only helped save our finance, but they're helping keep city services going. So um, bravo for our, our staff. They did a great job. Um, there's, there's kind of good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is um, some people are retiring because of our early retirement program to keep our budget balanced. And probably the one you are most likely to know about is Chief Tom. Um, and Chief Tom is, is a spectacular um, police chief and he is retiring in, in October. In the meantime, um, Captain um, Hill, Captain Jay Hill, is going to um, be the um, interim uh, chief while the city looks all on outside and inside for the best possible re uh, replacement for Tom. Granted, there isn't anybody that's going to be that fantastic, but we may come close. On a lighter note, there are a couple of new art ideas in downtown. The first one is there is a mural on Cypress Street that is called um, Walnut Creek Together. And it is um, a lovely piece of art significantly on its own, but it also uh, can, can be the background so that you can, or a friend, can stand in front and you will have butterfly wings. So if you take a picture and you send it to the hashtag areas on the sign nearby, you could actually win a prize. The other piece of fun is there is now a public art scavenger hunt. And in order to participate, all you need to do is take your smartphone and call 925-322 6427 and it will take you through um, some of the art in downtown Walnut Creek and yet again if you take pictures and submit it you could actually win a prize. You may also notice that there is a new person in the Zoom uh, picture list and that is Matt Francois and Matt is here to is is one of um, is a two-year council member and is doing a fantastic job. And one of the things that I appointed him or I requested the appointment for is for Matt to take over as part of the leadership for our diversity task force. So I'm going to ask Matt to give you 
a little deeper introduction of himself and also to tell you about the task force. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, President Kelso and board members. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Matt Francois. I'm a council member. I'm honored to represent you on the city council. I was elected in 2018. I'm a 20-year resident of Walnut Creek. My wife and I live in the Park Mead area. Uh, we have two children that we're quite proud of, and uh, Caroline, who's a sophomore at Wellesley College in Boston, and our son, Andrew, is a junior at Los Lomas. So we're almost empty masters, but not quite, and um, we've just thoroughly enjoyed living in this community, and I served on the Planning Commission for 11 years before running for City Council, and um, really enjoying this new role as well. I appreciate uh, the mayor taking the leadership on the on this issue of diversity and inclusion, obviously given this given the civil unrest not only in our community but nationwide, this is a pressing issue and one that I'm glad that Walnut Creek is is doing something proactive uh, about. And essentially, what we're doing is forming a task force, and the task force will be comprised of 15 members eventually. A third of those members will be city staff and the other two thirds of the task force will be made up of community members at large. Um, in our, at our July meeting, the council elected to appoint Vice Mayor Kevin Wilk and myself as representatives to that task force. So we have a consultant on board and unlike the typical governmental bureaucracies, we're going to try to work uh, faster than normal here. Now that we have the consultant, we're going to move forward with um, recruitment of members on the task force. And the task force will kind of be selected to look at some key items, which are a deep dive and a review of the city's internal and external policies related to hiring and training and making sure we don't, we're not, uh, doing that in, in a biased manner or in a manner that's not representative of including the most amount of people as possible. We're also going to ask the task force to advise us on um, both internal and external, external communications uh, to assist us with partnering with um, faith-based and other nonprofits so that we're not trying to do this alone, but working as part of this community together on building a more inclusive uh, society and then advising on developing forums that we can invite invite the larger community to come in and give us their opinions so ultimately what we expect is that the task force will be up and running by this fall and that by say at least by this time next year they will have produced a report and a, of recommendations that they'll provide to the city council that we can use then to implement and make uh, the city even greater than it already is. And um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to update you on that. I also, as you probably know, it is an election year um, and we have the, the nominate, the uh, filing period closed. There are eight candidates running for three seats. I'm very pleased to announce that our mayor is running for reelection as is our vice mayor, uh, Kevin Wilk. In addition, our colleague, uh, Justin Waddell, council member is running for re-election. And then we've got five newer candidates. Uh, one you may have heard of, a former, the former planning commissioner chair and an environmental scientist, Cindy Darling. And then the other candidates are Haley Ayers, Michael Sampson, Lauren Talbert, and Curtis Reese. So quite a lot of interest in, in the race this year as there is in politics in general. That's my report. And again, I, I'm pleased to be here and thank you for allowing me to speak and, and attend. Thank you, Council Member Fran Francois and Mayor Haskew. Are there any questions or from board members for the mayor or Council Member Francois? Okay, I don't see any. So thank you guys for giving us an update and uh, hopefully we'll see you again next month. Dwight, uh, Treasurer's report, please. Good morning. Uh, 
Lisa or Deborah, could you pull the treasurer's report up on the screen? I would appreciate that. While they're doing that, I'll just say that um, the $1.3 million revenue shortfall that we talked about in June across all um, 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 funds within the organization did not grow in July. So that is good news. Uh, in GRF operations, which is you know largely funded by the coupon, but also supported by golf revenue and some other revenue items, um, revenue has uh, fallen short year to date by 560,000. But due to uh, creativity and resourcefulness of uh, management and staff, uh, expenses have been reduced by 848,000. So a net surplus the budget through the end of July of 289,000, uh, which is a good spot to be. Uh, golf revenue, uh, we've been talking about this since uh, COVID hit. Um, when the chart comes up, you'll see it was a V-shaped recovery uh, for golf. Uh, second quarter showing a significant drop in revenue of 187000 from budget. Uh, but in July, bounced back to a $29,000 positive variance to budget, uh, which is great news. Uh, really, uh, as a result of increased resident play, but uh, more importantly, the change in uh, guests being allowed to play as of July 3rd uh, boosted that revenue uh, over budget. Um, so, and by the way, you know, every dollar over budget uh, it, it helps the surplus, which uh, helps the organization and uh, should yield a benefit to residents in the long term. Uh, so, GRF operations departments, uh, if you could go to the next chart, I just want to show that the resourcefulness and creativity across the organization in order to uh, overachieve budget results. In most cases, uh, the biggest one being maintenance, uh, only looking at essential uh, services there uh, to make sure that, um, that we can continue to live within our budget. Uh, maintenance is $144,000 positive variance to budget. Um, the other one, I, so, well, several other ones, but uh, Rossmore News and Channel 28 positive uh, variance the budget through July, which is good news uh, given the uh, advertising environment out there. Golf is the biggest one not uh, uh, achieving uh, budget uh, through July, and it's uh, almost entirely attributable to that loss of revenue. Uh, but of course, maintenance costs uh, had to continue uh, during uh, the COVID shutdown. So uh, great efforts across almost every department uh, within the within the organization, which is great. Uh, moving on to mutual operations, continues to have a shortfall from budgeted revenue of about 208000 uh, through the end of May, largely due to mutual billable, um, although alterations in resale revenue continues to be uh, below budget uh, due to um, uh, less activity in that area. Trust the state fund, if you could move on down to that area, um, showed a, a realized a stronger collection of membership fees in July. But year-to-date revenue is still about six hundred thousand dollars short of um, of what was expected and and uh, last year. So as a result, uh, the board has continued to and, and staff has continued to uh, um, stick to essential spending there and have about one point three million dollars in capital projects on hold. Uh, Rick put together a projection through the end of the year. It looks like about three point three million. Uh, in, in cash for uh, the trust the state fund by the end of the year, which is well above the minimum of 2.25 million uh, threshold. Uh, moving on to cash position. Um, cash position remains strong, as you can see, uh, but keep in mind that the PPP loan of 3.5 million uh, offsets uh, some of that cash uh, all of the PPP proceeds have been spent as prescribed by law, uh, but uh, final guidelines have not been um, received yet in terms of forgiveness of that loan uh, to convert it to a grant. So we don't know what the outcome of that process will be and probably won't know that until the beginning of next year. Uh, I think that's all I have. Continues to be a challenge, but I applaud the efforts of uh, uh, Tim and his managers with their efforts. Any questions? Bob, you're on mute. The Zoom, the Zoom mistake. I knew I'd make it sometime. Uh, okay, uh, no questions for Dwight. Thank you. Um, the CEO's report. 
Tim? Sorry, got to turn that off. Um, good morning, everybody. So first uh, up, I want to talk about the uh, pandemic and, and its broader effect and then the effect here in our community. When I wrote my report a week ago, the pandemic since then has significantly increased, although I think the encouraging news is that it's increasing at a slightly slower pace. A week ago, Contra Costa had 12,000 infections, and in just one week, we now have 13,200 as of this morning. And there's uh, been 14 more deaths and since my report was written. 172 people have died in our county. California uh, increased by more than 40,000 infections and now has 12,400 deaths. And the United States increased by 200,000 infections to 5.7 million with nearly 178,000 deaths as of this morning. Worldwide, there's been an increase in 2 million infections in just a week. So there's now 24 million people that have been infected and more than 821,000 deaths. The infections in all these jurisdictions are about 50% higher than they were just a month ago. And discouragingly, the virus is showing little signs of letting up. And as we all know by now, persons over the age of 65 are affected disproportionately to other age demographics. Make no mistake that the virus is here in Rossmore. I learned just this week that uh, there's been two infections of residents. I'm sure there's been more, but two that I've been notified of. And one of those residents has passed away from COVID. The decisions that each of us make and the risks that we take every day, in particular, whether to mask, sanitize, and practice social distancing, directly affects our health, the health of our friends, families, and neighbors, and impacts the speed at which these numbers will increase. So as, as you know, the um, Golden Rain Clubhouses continue to remain closed due to the health order. But uh, golf, pickleball, tennis, swimming, bocce, and lawn bowling have all been allowed to resume by the county health services with some restrictions. Now, I still get, uh, I'm contacted every single day by residents who are wondering um, when things are going to be opening or they're upset about the re restrictions of the things that are open. They don't like the protocols. They don't like the, the uh, different procedures that we've had to implement in order to comply with the health order. I'd like everybody to understand that the restrictions at each open amenity are imposed on us by the county and or the state. And our safety protocols are designed to keep us safe and in compliance and avoid having the county close the few amenities that are open. The difficulties that residents have making golf or swim reservations or the prohibition on doubles play for the racket and paddle sports or the limits on the rolling sports they're all necessary limitations or operational side effects of the county's health orders. The county wants us to minimize contact with others and has threatened to close these amenities down without compliance. There's little that Golden Rain can do to influence or change the county health authorities protocols and standards. The county has still not provided any hint as to when they might relax the restrictions. And so there's no word yet on when the fitness center or clubhouses will be allowed to reopen. However, yesterday, there was a new health order issued that does allow certain outdoor activities to resume. So we're in the process of evaluating that to see whether or not any of our um, operational changes in our clubhouses or amenities uh, can, can change as a result. The county's public health director also recently reminded us that, there are, that they are very concerned about Rossmore given that all of our residents fit at least one high risk category. The health director recently stated that the health orders are written for the general population and that Rossmore needs to proceed with even more caution given the vulnerabilities of our overall Rossmore population. So I'm going to repeat the reminders that we've all heard before because I think he, he, uh, the health director wanted me to restate these. So first, stay home unless you're exercising or obtaining essential services. I know that that's very restrictive. I know that that's very difficult to do. Uh, although with the smoke we've had recently, it's, it's easier to stay inside than it is to go outside. But um, as of today, the smoke has cleared for at least the day and, and uh, we'll hopefully even get back outside. But the health director is encouraging seniors to really stay inside unless you are out um, exercising or obtaining essential services. He's also asking that we stay home if we're ill. Don't venture out. Wash hands frequently with soap and water. 
cover your cough and sneeze, strictly adhere to social distancing practices, do not allow visitors in your home unless they are providing essential services, do not allow persons who are ill to enter your home, wear a mask when you're out in public or around visitors, and ask all visitors who are visiting your home to wear a mask uh, when they are with you. Additionally, the health director has asked us to emphasize that any resident having visitors or utilizing home health aides, nursing assistants, in-home attendants or caregivers to be sure to ask the health status of these individuals before allowing them in your home and insist on them wearing a mask during their entire stay with you. If you discover that a visitor has been exposed to COVID or is not feeling well or is otherwise symptomatic, have them call the county's drive-through testing site for caregivers the phone number is 925-570-0978 to schedule a COVID-19 testing appointment before allowing them in your home. Next, I, I wanna talk about fire mitigation and emergency planning status. You heard the mayor uh, describe uh, some a practice exercise that the city emergency personnel went through last year and this uh, past week's hot weather it reminds us everyone that the risk of fire remains elevated this summer and the fires that are burning, huge fires that are burning just outside of the Bay Area. So I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everybody to be fire alert and to be prepared. Be sure to have your go kit ready by the door in the event of a fire or other disaster. The Rossmore EPI, EPO website has excellent resources that are available on their website. They're designed specifically for Rossmore to help you prepare which you can find at www.rossmoreepo, that would be one word, rossmoreepo.org slash residents. And that will take you directly to the link uh, of the resources on their website. Golden Rain and the Mutuals meet or exceed all fire mitigation requirements. Inspectors from the Contra Costa Fire Protection District, that's the fire department, regularly travel throughout Rossmore and the open spaces, and they provide guidance and direction to minimize fire risk. I spoke with uh, landscape manager Rebecca Pollan the other day, and she provided me with this information. All seasonal fire abatement has been completed, including the cutting of wild grasses within 100 feet of buildings to three inches or less. They've completed the limbing up of trees. That means taking any uh, branches that are below 10 feet and limbing them up. Uh, from the ground. So we're trying to create a 10 foot gap between the ground and the, and the first uh, horizontal branch. And uh, that particular process goes on all year long because the trees grow. And so we're constantly doing that throughout the year, but we have completed that process as of now. The open space fire breaks have been disked to help the firefighters contain a fire in the event that one begins. Staff is working with CAL FIRE and the Diablo Fire Safe Council to secure any grants that we may be eligible for to help us manage fuels in open spaces and within defensible space. And we did obtain some grants last year for that. Certain types of shrubs have been identified by the fire department as having a higher fuel load than others. So the staff is working with the mutuals to carry out removable, re removal programs of these particular plants where they are close to buildings. I also want to provide you an update on the emergency operations plan, and this really follows a number of residents who've expressed concern, as, as typically happens at this time of the year when, when fires start up around Northern California. So um, I spoke with uh, Public Safety Manager Den Dennis Bell, and he provided me this update on the emergency operations plan. Golden Rain, as you know, retained the services of a consultant to assist with the January 2020 update of the plan. The EOP, the Emergency Operations Plan, was developed in collaboration with the following agencies, the City of Walnut Creek, Contra Costa County Office of Emergency Services, Contra Costa Fire Protection District, City of Lafayette, the Red Cross, Contra Costa ARC, Rossmore CERT, and the Rossmore Emergency Preparedness Organization. So people wonder, well, what's the EOP? What, what is it? What is it intended to accomplish? And so what it is, it's what's called an all hazards plan that Golden Rain can use when its resources and outside resources are managing through a major emergency. The plan does not exclusively address wildfires, but wildfires were considered in the development of the plan. In fact, that was the reason for the update to the plan. And wildfire data was evaluated prior to the completion of the plan. 
At multiple presentations to the Rossmore community, the consultant demonstrated sophisticated fire mapping technology that evaluates topography, fuel load, temperature, wind speed, and historical wildland fire activity in the areas in, the, in this specific area. All of this was used to model and predict how wildland fires starting outside of Rossmore's residential areas may impact the community. Golden Rain learned through this process that while a fire may spread into Rossmore, it is unlikely that a fire would overtake all of Rossmore at one time. Contra Costa Fire Protection District personnel reviewed this data and they agreed that while an area of Rossmore may need to evacuate, a mass evacuation of Rossmore is unlikely. The consultants developed what, what we've called, or they've called, emergency management zones for Rossmore. And Golden Rain shared these zones with the city of Walnut Creek and the fire department. Both the city and the fire department supported the EMZs, the management zones, and believed that they could be used by the civil authorities to manage evacuations. The city of Walnut Creek is responsible for managing and planning for evacuations, not the Golden Rain Foundation. I know that there's a lot of residents who um, have expressed interest in Golden Rain uh, planning for and managing an evacuation, but we've um, the fire marshal made that very clear that we are not allowed to do that. That is not our responsibility. In fact, um, they actually withdrew participation in the plan unless we remove that language from the plan. So that had to come out of the emergency operations plan. Golden Rain cannot have anything to do with the evacuation. Uh, we will support and assist when it's, ne when it's necessary and requested by the emergency personnel. Next, I want to talk about is the budget. Since the clubhouses are mostly closed, there are some residents who continue to insist that residents should re receive a refund of their coupon. As I've stated several times in previous columns in the newspaper and at Golden Rain board meetings, that is unlikely to happen during the fiscal year. To understand why a coupon refund is unlikely before year end, you have to understand how the budget is constructed. So I'm gonna explain that. Your coupon includes the cost of providing the maintenance of your mutual, which is roofing, painting, the siding, landscaping, repairs, utilities, legal costs, insurance, and reserves. Those are the primary expenses in your mutual. It also includes $293 for the Golden Rain Foundation cost to provide the amenities, the streets, the clubhouses, and the Comcast internet and cable. With few exceptions, virtually all of Golden Rain services are being provided at pre-pandemic levels, but without hundreds of thousands of dollars in fee revenue to help offset costs, as the treasurer delineated in his report this morning. There's no ability for Golden Rain or your mutual to absorb a coupon refund without a corresponding surplus of funds to distribute. Let me explain the key concepts around a surplus, which is when revenue exceeds expenses that are needed to operate. So first, as a nonprofit organization, there's no profit or cushion that's built into the mutual or Golden Rain budgets to absorb unanticipated reductions in revenue. The Golden Rain budget is created each year to cover the operating costs after subtracting fee revenue. Nothing more is collected. There's no other cushion built in into the budgets. The net expense is funded by the coupon and passed to the mutuals in accordance with the trust agreement. The expenses of Golden Rain include the costs of operating the amenities and maintaining the facilities, roads, and open space, but they also include such critical services as utilities, insurance, and the insurance is property, liability, directors and officers, fidelity, automobile, workers' comp, umbrella, and earth earthquake coverage. It also includes legal and administrative costs and management. And without any of these key services and insurance, Golden Rain would cease to function. So second, the trust agreement gives Golden Rain's board the discretion to distribute any Golden Rain surplus to its membership after the books are closed for the year. That typically happens in the spring once the financial audit is concluded. The board may decide to refund the surplus or it could decide to reduce the following year's coupon by the amount of the surplus or it could allocate some or all of the surplus to a reserve fund, all of which effectively returns the surplus to the membership. If a surplus exists, the board will do something about it. Third, there's no certainty that Golden Rain will in fact have a surplus. There's still tremendous economic uncertainty due to the pandemic. All of Golden Rain's fee revenue for two months was essentially wiped out during the initial phase of the lockdown in March and April and the early part of May. Recreation and fitness net revenue remain at or near zero since mid-March. 
through July, total revenues, as the treasurer mentioned, are down $560,000 from budget. However, we've cut expenses significantly by $849,000, which results in a $289,000 budget variance year to date, positive variance. It's expected that this number will continue to grow between now and the year end if there is no significant change in the health orders. This could change if the health orders become either more restrictive in the coming months or are relaxed to allow facilities to open. It would be irresponsible for the board to arbitrarily cut services just to create an artificial refund that would hamper the board's ability to restart services once the health orders are relaxed and our facilities can begin to reopen. I hear every day from residents how anxious people are to use the fitness center, the studios, the clubhouses, as soon as we're allowed to open them. The board and the finance committee are carefully monitoring the financial results and will continue to make prudent budget adjustments throughout the rest of the year. If Golden Rain ends the year with a surplus, it will be dealt with as I noted above. The 2021 budget meeting is coming up in about two and a half weeks. The staff will be proposing revenue and expense adjustments related to the pandemic for the 2021 budget that will be presented to the board and finance committee on September 15th. Residents are invited to attend the meeting on Zoom and offer feedback during resident forum. I also want to provide an update on the creek. I saw that in the newspaper. They, they, I got ahead of my announcement. Um, but as we've been reporting now for more than two years, there's been significant erosion in the creek near the parking lot at Buckeye Tennis Courts and just adjacent to the Creekside Pickleball Courts. There are numerous regulatory agencies involved anytime a landowner touches a waterway. In essence, you're prohibited from touching a waterway, uh, modifying anything in a waterway uh, in the state of California without governmental and regulatory approval. So in our case, that includes the federal and state departments of fish and wildlife, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Regional Water Quality Control Board. The repair designs have now been submitted. They've been submitted many, many months ago, uh, back a year ago, to all of these agencies, they've had multiple meetings, they've come and walked the property, they've offered a, a number of suggestions and amendments to our initial plan, and it is now approved and we have the permits. So today, the Golden Rain Board will be considering staff's recommendation for a repair contractor. And in accordance with the terms of the permits, the repair work will need to be completed by October, or we will have to wait until late uh, May of 2021 to commence. So the, the extraordinarily good news is that the original engineer's estimate of approximately a million dollars to repair the creek, uh, the bids came in at significantly lower numbers, and we'll discuss those a little bit later this morning. The last item in my report is employee transitions. In July, we had five employees begin their employment with Golden Rain. Mark Langford on the golf course pro shop, Madison Azevedo, uh, Gabriel Estenaz, Martiz, Grace Metters, and Caitlin O'Connor, all lifeguards. We had 10 employees leave Golden Rain in July. Spencer Hino and, the, um, and Julie Hughes and Dennis Shimoko, all fitness trainers at the fitness center. Susan Rittner, our longtime station manager, retired for, from Channel 28. Joseph Gusenkov, Vitaly Gusenkov, Donald Calisardo, Sunshine Reese, Rachel Rosen and James Verma all left Golden Rain and they were all lifeguards in the aquatics department. And that's my report. Thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim? They seeing none, we're ready for the residence forum. During the residence forum, Residents will follow Rossmore custom and limit their comments to three minutes. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the resident forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented as members do consider them as they act during the meeting. If you wish to address the board, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if connecting via video, uh, via phone audio only. Uh, and you can do that now. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature uh, located in the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residents forum. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. Once the residents forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. 
Mr. President, we have two uh, speakers uh, for the Residence Forum. The first is Mary England. Mary, go ahead and state your full name and Rossmore address, and you may have three minutes to address the board. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary England, 1200 Fairlawn Court, Entry 5. And I would like to comment on the GRF Policy Committee draft uh, policy involving policies, rules, and procedures titled number 100. It's my opinion that the GRF Policy Committee and Board would benefit by a new approach or a strategy to really encourage GRF members, staff, and others to adopt and promote compliance with the policies, rules, and procedures. How would this happen? Well, I think the GRF board could charter a compliance function that could be a subcommittee of policy. It could be a task force ad hoc committee and begin to really make the case with GRF members and stakeholders what the advantage of compliance would be. I think emphasizing compliance over punitive language such as violation enforcement would be a good investment, not costing any money. Um, I know the GRF board sent back the draft policy to include more Def definition on due process. What could that include? Uh, I've looked up procedural due process and it would include an unbiased tribunal, notice of proposed action, opportunity to present reasons for the action, the right to present evidence, call witnesses, no opposing evidence, cross-examination, representation by counsel, and uh, that a tribunal decision would be based only on evidence. So I think this is a really good start on a positive approach that the board and committee could take to tone down violation enforcement language and practices. So I support looking into compliance as a new approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Our next uh, speaker is another Mary. Mary, go ahead and unmute yourself and state your full name and Rossmore address. And then you may have three minutes to address the board. Hello, uh, my name is Mary Ramus. I live at 2145 Ptarmigan, uh, number one. And I mentioned uh, this yesterday to the Finance, Commit uh, Finance Committee in um, addressing insurance because all of us are experiencing uh, massive increases in our insurance. And I don't know that GRF uh, board addresses the, has a committee that looks at the insurance. Um, and and I, I hope they do because it's affecting all of us in individually. So therefore I believe it is affecting the uh, coupon for the GRF. Um, and there's many parts of the insurance. I, I years ago had a company and my general liability and workers comp was based on the wages of my employees. I don't know if that's the way it works for GRF. Uh, and then as Tim mentioned, the E and O insurance, property insurance, umbrellas, liability, auto insurance, auto liability, uh, all of that. I don't. I, I just am hoping that there is an insurance committee that looks at all of that uh, and negotiates, and perhaps even could help negotiate uh, for the mutuals to all kind of get together and negotiate together. I don't know the process, so I'm kind of asking for somebody to explain it, maybe in a meeting, or if there is an insurance company co committee. I haven't seen it. 
And then lastly, um, I heard uh, Dwight on his report mention that all the PP, PPP money is spent. At some point, we need a full accounting. And I, uh, Tim mentioned the coupon and you know no refunds and all of that. Um, but somewhere along the line, money, the PPP money is replacing other monies that is still being paid through the coupon. So I would like to see a full accounting other than the board saying the money spent. I don't know what that means. Spent on what? I know it's supposed to go to wages, but I'd like to see a full accounting. And uh, that's it for me. And thank you all. I know you're working at a difficult time and, and trying to address all these things. And uh, we as residents appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Mr. President, that uh, concludes the residence forum. Thank you, Lisa and residents. Uh, we'll move on to the resident member committee reports now. Brian, are you online here for aquatics? There you are. Yeah. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, our recent meeting was uh, short, as you can see by our, by our minutes, but um, uh, we did kind of uh, tackle one question that had been bothering a lot of residents for a while, and that was how to get a time to swim. Uh, a lot of people were shut out. And we did some research uh, with the aid of Jeff Matheson and found that um, a large number of people were getting uh, seven swims a week um, through apparently uh, figuring out how to get registered. Um, apparently, there's no way to game the system. You have to work in the hours that are there. Uh, just some folks were staying up pretty late to do it and um, getting lots of swims in and other people weren't. Um, what we did as a committee was cut the number of maximum, maximum number of swims per week per swimmer to five from seven. And according to our numbers, that would open approximately 150 swim slots a week uh, over the whole schedule for more people to get in and swim. Uh, and also, uh, Jeff worked with the, uh, the IT folks and got the um, sign in uh, app and website adjusted so the um, the website and the app come online at the same time the phone call uh, service does for reservations to eliminate that um, seven hour head start that people could get online or with the app to line up for uh, for available slots. Um, heard a couple uh, things about uh, from people that were swimming seven days a week that weren't happy. Uh, also got some feedback from people who weren't able to swim, who could finally get some time scheduled, and they obviously were a little happier about that. <clears throat> One of the things I like to remind the community of is that since amenities are limited, uh, we have uh, much more usage of the pools than we've seen in the past, and it's on an upward trend. Uh, so it's probably going to be busier um, till we get this thing resolved. Uh, we just want people to re uh, remind each other that uh, – we're all in this together and we all like to swim and we want to be there swimming. Um, accusations and, and problems with staff uh, are not the cause of, of the situation. Basically, it was overuse mainly. Um, hopefully, people can uh, scale back a little bit. Folks that need to swim seven days a week maybe could think about walking a couple days and, and doing other things to open up some more slots. A lot of folks are dependent on the pools for their, their fitness um, and relaxation and uh even folks go there and practice mindfulness people use the pools for a lot of things um i want to remind people that uh in fairness we really should learn how to share kind of like kindergarten but uh we're hoping that people can can get through this people have been doing a pretty good job and i really want to thank the aquatic staff for for doing an exemplary job uh with the fair amount of turnover we've had recently and a lot of new people coming on uh, it's great to see all these new faces looking out for us. And also, uh, as a, a multiple time a week swimmer myself, I noticed that, um, the sanitizing, uh, uh um, disciplines they've been uh, doing and, and things just basically taking care of us at the pool. Um, they haven't slacked in their duties at all that I've been able to see. And, uh, I'm really happy to see their dedication to providing good service. Any questions on uh, anything else aquatics? Dale, and then Dwight. Great. Uh, yeah, Brian, I've noticed on some of the uh, reports the, the term unique user versus sign-ins. What is, what is a unique user? 
Uh, boy, I'm not quite sure about that one. Oh, here's Jeff. Uh, Jeff can answer that question. So uh, a unique user is how many different residents are signing up. So if we have uh, a thousand unique visitors, but we have 10,000 uses, you know that a thousand people are making up that 10,000 uses. It's, it's the number of different individuals utilizing the facility. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Right. Well, I just wanted to say congratulations on over 700 unique users. That means we have 700 happy uh, residents uh, using the pools. I, I was also impressed that uh, online reservations uh, comprising 80% of the reservations made. That, that was a remarkable number to me in such a short period of time to get that system up and running. So congrats to everybody involved. Well, and I think in the long run, the system has proved pretty easy to use. Uh, most people have adapted pretty well to it. And uh, for the folks that haven't been able to do that or, or don't care to, uh, we have a, a great phone reservation system that works pretty well from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. It gives them a lot of time to, to sign in. It's great to see people using the facilities that are available um, and being out there working out and swimming and enjoying themselves. Any other questions? So Jeff, I have a question for you. At the aquatics meeting, I thought it was uh, mentioned that the time going online couldn't be adjusted, but Brian seemed to indicate you figured out a way to do that. Is that true? In uh, working with, with MindBody, initially they had reported back to us that the system couldn't be adjusted. It had to be as the new time student days open at midnight. Uh, one of our, our staff members, Javier, was has been working with MindBody in the program and, and he was able to figure out a way to, to make that happen. So we've made that adjustment now. Great, good job. Any other questions for Brian? Okay, uh, thanks, Brian. You're uh, welcome. Mitty, uh, John. Thanks, Bob. Good morning. Um, the audit committee met on August 10th. Uh, we introduced three new board members to the committee, and so we're up to our full complement of uh, seven committee members, which is great. Uh, we elected a vice chair and secretary. Um, our outside accounting firm, Shayla Ba Doberstein, uh, attended the meeting and presented drafts of the financial statements for the pension and 401k audits. Uh, this is their first year on the retirement plan audit and it sounds like uh, things are going smoothly um, and there were no issues for the committee. Um, at the time of the meeting, they were still awaiting some third party documentation. And so once that comes in, they will, they will finalize the uh, audits and uh, present the uh, reports at the next uh, audit committee meeting in September. Uh, that date hasn't been uh, scheduled yet, but we're working with SLD on that. Um, we followed up with a discussion of uh, audit committee considerations in this COVID-19 environment, uh, talked a bit about internal control, um, and in that context, talked about uh, re remote access. And uh, as you know, a lot of companies are having their employees um, work remotely. And uh, we were pleased to hear that the accounting staff um, at Rossmore is working on site. And so we don't have the same uh, concerns that others might as far as uh, employees working remotely. Um, we talked a bit about cyber uh, security, which is not uh, uh, specifically a COVID-19 issue, but uh, you know, cyber attacks and ransomware are in the news quite a bit now and are of general concern uh, to the organization and uh, heard that IT is continuing to work on those issues and monitoring those issues. And uh, so we'll get updates uh, in uh, future meetings. Um, and then finally, Tim summarized uh, the progress made um, on enterprise risk management, uh, summarizing what Rick and Tim presented at the last uh, board meeting. Um, ERM was an issue that the audit committee was uh, focused on last year. And uh, so we've been pleased with the progress that's been made uh, in that area. Um, that's my report. Any questions? 
I don't see any. Thank you, John. Uh, Finance Committee, Bill. Good morning. Uh, the Finance Committee met on August 25th. Uh, we reviewed projections both in the operating and the trust estate fund. And while some activities are picking up due to restored revenue, uh, to help restore revenue to historic normal levels, uh, we still haven't reached that from a financial activity standpoint. So the committee urges caution in any current proposed expenditures. The committee reviewed requests by staff and do have the following recommendation that there are sufficient funds to approve the contract with GJR Development for $120,000 plus a 20% contingency permit and consulting fees for a total of $300,000. This relates to creek repairs near the Buckeye parking lot and the Creekside pickleball courts. There were two other uh, administrative items that were dealt with, and then I'd like to go through the projections for uh, the future for the, for the trust estate fund. The committee reviewed the finance committee charter and recommend a change in wording to provide that part of the mission of the committee is to review MOD fees. Wording of that recommendation is attached to the uh, 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 minutes, but has also uh, been forwarded to the policy committee and I will be attending their meeting to further um, elaborate on that issue uh, next week. Also, as required by the Finance Committee Charter, the committee reviewed the membership transfer fee level, as is required to be done every year, to determine whether it should be increased, decreased, or remain the same for the next year. And the committee recommends that there be no change in the membership transfer fee at $10,000 for the next year. Uh, finally, uh, I wanted to go over with uh, everyone. Ah. The short term trust estate fund projection. The short term trust estate fund projection is what the committee uses to estimate what we will be doing in the membership, excuse me, in the trust estate fund for the next, uh, in this case, five months. And what we do is we project out what we believe to be the membership transfer fee level. We had originally put in 17 tra transfers for, per month for a total of $170,000 per month. That number appears to have been uh, relatively too low. Uh, and, and, and in reality, we've been seeing numbers in the 30 range and so on uh, through the prior, prior several months. We've therefore modified the membership transfer fee projection, what we believe will be the membership transfer fee level for the next five months at 26, conservatively 26 per month. The total for the year then would, uh, for the next uh, five months would be about $1,300,000. Uh, uh, what we then do is we take that, uh, move it down a little bit. Hold on. There we go. We move down and we put in the projections of expenses, our debt service, and then also as encumbered funds. These are funds that have already been committed and projects are underway or expect to be underway in these particular months. So for example, we estimated uh, now creek repair that payments might need to be made in the months of uh, September and October, October and November, but somewhere in those in that range. Uh, as you can see, we have HVA re re replacement and some other expenses. Uh, but we had been in the past saying, "Wait, don't don't spend any more money uh, at this point uh, than than you immediately or than you have to." We come down to the level of. Revenue minus expenses uh, over that period of time and actually come up with an ending reserve balance that's uh, spent down by about $684,000. But again, we're beginning that period with 4,000,006. If we take into account the $2.25 million targeted minimum reserve, which the board has directed us to uh, consider in uh, doing these uh, projections, 
we end up with a net fund va- balance at the end of the year of a million seven oh six. Okay, uh, keeping in keeping in mind that we have a two million two hundred fifty thousand dollar targeted reserve. What that tells us is that there are funds available this year, if the board chooses to do so, to fund other projects. But however, however, we're going into the next year with the following caveats. Uh, and I will read this here. Based on these projection funds, uh, funds would be available now for a number of projects, provided the following cautions are recommended by the committee. Number one, rental income from the medical center will cease on July 31st, 2021. Number two, the board has previously committed to consider setting up a reserve through encumbered funds of $400,000 for renovation of Gateway Studios. It's not been encumbered officially, so we don't list it here, and it's not expected to be expended, of course, but it is a if you will, a, 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 an additional item to the targeted fund reserve. That is something that the board would like to consider uh, holding off on and not spending, uh, keeping it as a, uh, a buildup for uh, possible reno- re- renovations in the future. Thirdly, the amount of targeted reserve remains at $2,250,000. So you can see that going into the next year, we do have some funds that are going to be available based on our projections. And I believe the projections are, are accurate at this point. Uh, keep in mind, however, that part of this money needs to be considered for uh, the, uh, renov- the renovation of the Gateway Studios, uh, if that's what the board chooses. And uh, also that we're going in with the understanding that we will be losing the $57,000 a month that comes in every month on the medical center beginning right at the beginning of the year, 2021. Uh, does the board have any questions on the district, uh, on the uh, projections? Just a clarification, it's January 31st, not July 31st. That I'm be sorry, January 31st. The rent. Uh, so yes. Bill, if you could uh, stop screen sharing, I can't see all the board members to, there sorry, we go. Okay. Questions? Any questions for Bill? Okay, I don't see any. Oh, Dwight. If, if I could just emphasize a point that Bill made in, in projecting revenue to the trust estate fund. Uh, yes, the, the last couple of months, we've seen some uh, uh, encouraging signs in collections of MTF. That could change any day. And we need to recognize that, uh, you know, we're still in an uncertain time period here. Uh, so these are projections. I think it is showing a healthy uh, situation uh, going into next year. But we still have, uh, you know, we still have lots of questions in terms of COVID's impact on us in future months. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Fitness Center Advisory Committee, Catherine. Um, August was the second Zoom meeting for the Fitness Center Advisory Committee, and we've begun to get. Oh, sorry. Start my video. How's that? Good. Okay. Um, August was the second Zoom meeting for the Fitness Center Advisory Committee, and we've begun to get the hang of it. Active Wellness described activities staff are able to support in spite of the gym's continued closure. Notably, we have 12 live stream classes with the addition this week of two new yoga classes. The Fitness Center newsletter lists the schedule for these as well as offering printable workouts, stay at home workouts, and a schedule of channel 28 exercise programs. Our trainers conducted nearly 300 personal exercise sessions with residents over Zoom in July. The county has not given us a reopening date for the gym yet. Once we have a date, staff will publicize plans for the Tice Creek Gym on the website, in the Fitness Center newsletter, and in the Rossmore News. The UC Davis Alzheimer's Research Program planned for Rossmore is adapting itself to the pandemic. 
Our trainer, Noah Yuzna, is involved in two weeks of training in preparation for its start here. We will be hearing soon about the research plans and how to sign up to participate. So far, the personal training sessions that staff has conducted on Zoom have not had a fee. As the community has become more comfortable with the virtual format, staff recommended and the committee agreed to a return to the pre-COVID rates of $35 for a half an hour and $60 for an hour of personal training. This will provide some income to GRF. The rates, along with the benefits of personal training, will be publicized once a date to begin the fees is finalized. Of course, many residents may not have used their two free hours of personal training for this year. These may be used for the virtual sessions. Any questions? Dale? Uh, about how long is the duration of each of the uh, fitness schedules? or programs or whatever you would call it, sessions, about how long, is it half an hour or, or what? Um, I'd say about half an hour. Some of them are shorter, some of them are a little longer. Um, there's some variation. Thank you. Dwight? So you're returning to fees for uh, personal training. What about for the uh, classes? Or the, fees? We have, we have, we're not planning on classes at this point uh, because of the social distancing. Our, our classes I mean, have, have always been, for the most part, free of charge unless they're a specialty class. Uh, and the ones that we're doing live stream right now are all free of charge. Any other questions for Catherine? <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, Golf Advisory, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, the uh, Golf Advisory Committee met uh, in August via Zoom, and we're trying to get the hang of that. Uh, we did have a discussion in, included in your packet this morning, uh, in addition to the golf course superintendent's report and uh, uh, Mark's uh, report, is a an advisory from the golf course advisory committee I, we don't do this very often but we did have discussion and it had to do with the timing of the golf course and it may not come as a surprise but still we want to present uh, the case to reopen the uh, golf course to normal operations um, as i've uh, sort of outlined in the letter to you uh, the reasons for that so I uh, won't go over that, but I know that you'll be assessing the uh, whether to open or not um, uh, later on in the meeting. I do want to thank uh, the treasurer for uh, showing at least the uh, bounce back and the revenue on the uh, monthly uh, basis for the golf course. I think it helped us to uh, uh, visualize that there is demand on the golf course. We know that. And it is impacted uh, by not being able to have uh, full use of the facilities. Uh, so normal operations uh, still allows uh, people to use a golf course for a walking on, on Mondays, as has always been the case on both courses. So we would ask you to uh, give consideration to uh, reopening the golf course um, later on in the meeting. Uh, so I will uh, leave it at that if there's any questions for you. I don't see anything. Uh, Dwight? So a question for Mark. Uh, I see that merchandise sales are way off. Should, should we all be shopping at the pro shop? I mean, even though I'm not a golfer, I could buy some shirts or something. Is that where... Where's Mark? He doesn't want to sell anything today. I am. Uh, I am here. My video is not up, but uh, uh, thank you, Dwight. Yeah, you'll see an article coming in the next um, uh, Rossmore News applauding those that have come in, but asking for more support. Obviously, this is a difficult time for any brick and mortar, but uh, uh, please come down and buy the Rossmore logo and anything else that you might like to see. We do continue to get some new products in. I have cut back on my buying because of our our 
uh, situation with the pandemic, but we still have a very nice full shop of great products. So uh, yes, thank you for the shout out. Please support the golf shop. Thank you. If I could just uh, jump in again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Sure, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to also uh, uh, give credit to uh, Mark and actually the advisory committee and the uh, security folks uh, for the uh, emergency access uh, map that we have and that uh, Securitas uh, uses when uh, there is an event on, on the golf course. Uh, there was considerable thought uh, went into that, and there were uh, a couple of hiccups over the years as we uh, tried to identify more precisely how that could be done. Uh, and it's really nice to see that it, uh, it's come to fruition and has gotten some recognition for that. I think it's a, a great addition to the, to the golf course. I agree. So, Mark, uh, maybe we could look forward to a fashion show at the next board meeting or a spread in the Rossmore News. Uh, demonstrate some, you know, uh, walk the, 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 what do they call it? The, the uh, whatever they walk, showing off clothes. Uh, are you, uh, are you volunteering the board, uh, Bob, for that uh, sure, fashion we, show? Sure, okay, sure. All right. We, we want to help out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that for the next board meeting. Okay, Carl. Yes, uh, Mark, uh, I was wondering, uh, has smoke made a significant difference in golf revenue? Yeah, the, the last two weeks have been difficult. Uh, we started with uh, very high heat, uh, and that certainly cut down on play. Uh, and, and really being outside, I think, for everybody and whatever their activities were. Then we had the lightning storms. And then that was followed, of course, by the fires. So we have seen a drop, but we had play every day, even during some of those really tough days. I would say we we're running at about 50, 60 percent of our normal rounds. So a drop, yes, but um, we did not close. Right. I noticed a, a comment about a lake leak, and I just wonder how significant that is and what the impact is on our water usage and water bills? Sure. Um, we had a meeting with the company that did the lake over 25 years ago. We had them come out and look at it. The leak, the leak appears to be high in the, in the pond uh, because right now what we've done, so it, we have no leak, is we've dropped the level a little bit and we have no leakage. Anything that has come down the weir from the leak when it's higher um, it cycles back up into the lake because it's in a, in an area where it goes down to the pump, uh, that's in the Creek and it pumps it back up. So we're not losing really any water. Um, as far as repair, uh, we are going to wait till the end of the season since it's not anything too significant, uh, October, they're going to come back out and bring divers and look at where the leak exactly is and, and, and what the problem is. And then we will assess what we need to do to, to fix the problem. Uh, and, and so we'll have a better idea uh, later this year and look at repairing it. It, it. it may be something that we can look at next year if it's not too big of a problem, or we may even be able to hold off till 2022 uh, because like I said, it, it's, it's there, it's minor, and, and we will assess it later. Dale? Mark, hold, Mark, can you also describe where that water goes you described it to the golf committee and, and I thought that was really helpful. Sure. Um, so what happens right now is the, the, the leak or wherever it comes out is, is managing going into the weir, which is at the end of the lake, that weir then feeds down to the Creek, which ends up down in our retention area where the pump is. And that's where it gets recycled back up into the lake. So that's why we don't have any really net loss that way. We're picking up that water. Um, the, the, but anyway, we're capturing that water. Is that, is that what you want me to emphasize a little more, Tim? Okay. Yeah. Dale. Uh, Mark, is it possible that you might be able to repair that without having to drain the lake? Um, well, it is possible. Yes. But that's why we're waiting till October because we don't use water in October. So if the water goes down at that point, we will have turned off East Bay mud. We, we can pretty much survive off of nature at that time. So 
then the net loss will be not much at all since uh, we can recollect that uh, through nature. So that's why we're waiting until later in the season. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. no. Kathleen? Well, how long has this leak been going on? I have noticed the water coming down there for quite a while. Has it been going on for years? No, no, it was first noticed, I would say sometime this summer, um, maybe even into spring, we started seeing it. We will have some water grow over the top of the lake at times, um, especially in the winter time and spring because of the rainfall. But uh, it was after we dried out and, and reached summer that we really noticed ah, when the lake is at this level, we, we see something that's going on and, and that's when we started dropping the level so we wouldn't have that problem. John? Um, I believe there's, Mark, uh, help me with this. I believe there's also water that comes in from the, um, from the housing along the fairway right about there too. Uh, isn't, isn't there a, another? Um, yeah, we have, a that's a drainage. good point, John. We, we do have uh, drainage throughout the valley and there is a drain that comes in from across the first fairway on Creekside and can dump some water in there. So uh, some excess could be from that also. Um, we have picked up a lot of water in the last month from the high temperatures and the air conditioners. So that has helped our water use. And we were actually better off this month than last month because it was warmer. And uh, our water bill actually went down when it was hotter. It's a strange conundrum as far as the, the water usage, but that's what happened. So one concern I have uh, is that that water running under there might have undermined that uh, walkway right there. So I'm just hoping you guys monitor that to make sure we don't have some catastrophic collapse there or anything, because there was quite a bit of water going out of there earlier in the summer, I know. Yeah, we did. We did absolutely look at that, Bob. And that's why we had him out to see if we were in a situation where we may have a bit larger problem underneath than we'd anticipated. Uh, the feeling was as we went around the area that we were just fine. Um, and, and that we would, could hold off until October to see exactly what was going on. So I think we're, we're safe that way, but your concern is, is valid. Great, any other questions for John or Mark? Dale? I don't have a question. I have a comment for all the residents who attend our meetings. I wear one of my many golf shirts at our board <laughs> meetings every month. So if you are interested in seeing what they look like, uh, you can uh, tune in. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dale. Okay, uh, looks like that's that's it for golf. Uh, resident, uh, now we're board committee reports, compensation, Kathleen. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so the uh, compensation committee uh, met in August, uh, just a few days ago, and it was to review the medical health plans for the non-union employees, which uh, we had put off because uh, until this month because we wanted um, uh, HR to look at other companies. And so we, uh, we had a discussion about the uh, benefit plans, uh, comparisons between Kaiser, which they now have, and uh, some other companies. But um, in the discussion, we found that it was really very complicated to assess this because uh, you have to consider what the employees pay for each of these other ones, um, plus the services rendered uh, for each of the other ones. We did find that some of the, the other plans were lower, but the committee felt that changing from one medical plan to another uh, can create significant disruptions for employees and their families. Uh, open enrollment is just about to start and there is not enough time to prepare the staff uh, for the change or the logistics of enrolling 100 staff members and dependents on a new plan. Uh, but the committee is keeping in mind that the residents uh, you know, pay for these um, benefits and uh, any increase in health care uh, cost would affect the monthly coupon. So the committee recommended to HR to accept uh, and renew the current health and welfare plan programs for non-union GRF employees for the calendar year of 2021, but also to look at more comparative, uh, comprehensive review of available uh, uh, health 
uh, benefit plans early in 2021 so that we would have an adequate time to prepare employees uh, for the potential uh, of a significant uh, plan change. Now, it isn't, isn't saying we would change it, but we will do a more comprehensive review uh, to see if that uh, uh, would work. Uh, they have had Kaiser for uh, quite, a, quite a few years, um, so we would really have to consider a change seriously. And um, that was all. Any questions for Kathleen Carl? Yes, I think the other thing is we really didn't have, we knew what the present rates were, but we had no idea of how these various companies increase rates over the year. And without that information, uh, I think that part of our decision was that we needed this information. The other factor is we didn't want to force people to change health plans in the mid of this pandemic. Yes, those are good points. Good decision. <clears throat> Any other questions for Kathleen? Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, planning, Carl? Yes, uh, we looked at uh, three things. We continued to look at uh, starting to get some initial cost estimates of the trail. And, and we uh, looked at, and we're going to look, continue to look into that. The other thing is we felt that it's important to improve communication. And we started looking into that. One of the things we also discussed, which I think would improve communications, is some sort of public repository for planning documents. So we, and as well as uh, periodic project status reports to keep residents better informed of what's going on in the planning process. Any questions for Carl? Kathleen? <clears throat> So again, I, I would just add to Carl's um, that one of the considerations was to um, work first on the paths uh, and then consider later the, um, the, the planting that would go around them to make them little parks. Because uh, I think the biggest consideration is that we have places to walk that's not on the golf course and not on the sidewalks. And um, so, but we, when we get estimates, um, at our next meeting and look at it further, we'll know a little bit more about that. Okay, any other questions for Carl? Dwight? I would just like to add that uh, Tim and Deborah, and I'm, Anne, I'm not sure who all was involved, but added uh, components to the Rossmore website that has studies uh, that have been done in the past that uh, still are, are current for uh, board and residents to review, as well as department deep dive. So a uh, good, repository of information that's available to uh, all the residents as well as board members. Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, Policy Committee, Ken. <clears throat> You're muted, Ken. Still muted. I don't know why that didn't unmute for me. So I guess I'll start again. Uh, good morning, everybody. The policy committee continues to work on policies for safe demonstrations and uh, on non-discriminations and non-harassment. Next Tuesday on the 1st of September at 1.30, uh, we will reintroduce the policy on enforcement with a special emphasis on providing a, a now detailed um, due process process, uh, including legal counseling. Um, the issue of whether we, and we will introduce the issue of whether or not to have term limits for resident um, member committees. Well, that will be introduced and we'll appreciate uh, anybody's input on that as possible. That concludes 
my report. Any questions for Ken? Okay, thank you, Ken. So I'm going to deviate from the agenda and um, move item 11C up now. So uh, poor John's been waiting uh, on hold here, so to speak. And then after that, we'll have a break. Uh, so John, are you still around, still awake, hopefully? Tim, uh, I, uh, I am here. Good, Tim, do you want to introduce this topic? Um, I can't start the video. Oh, okay, just, okay, here we go. Let me, uh, there we go, <laughs> okay. Okay, John, I think I'm gonna ask Tim to just say a few words first. Okay. okay. Yeah, so, sure. so John Taster is our representative from Gallagher, uh, Arthur J. Gallagher Insurance Services. Gallagher is represented not just GRF, but GRF and the mutuals, which is a, um, the insurance is kind of an aggregated plan, which is unique um, and, it's, and it's very complicated. John's gonna describe for you today how the insurance is set up and all the various layers, how that all works. He's not gonna go into great detail about that because I don't think anybody's interested in that high level of detail, but he does have in your packet uh, um, a chart that clearly shows about 35 different insurers who um, insure this valley. So it's a, it's a complicated arrangement. Uh, John typically comes every year or so to describe this both to the board and to the presidents, the mutual presidents. And then uh, I know he's made presentations to the Rossmore community in the past as well. So we'd like to have John describe uh, the insurance model, the um, estimated, we don't have a quote yet, I don't believe, but we have an estimate as to what the insurance premium might be for next year. And also their contract has expired. So in order for him to place the coverage for the next year, we need to have the board take an action to approve their contract. So after, after when he's finished today, we will, I wanna make sure we don't forget about that. We'll um, take a look at his proposal for next year. So John. Okay, thank you. I know that um, I think Rick is going to um, share our presentation on the screen. Uh, before we get into that, I just want to uh, mention that um, uh, it was interesting to hear a question early on about insurance on the day that you were going to have the presentation about insurance. So what, um, it, what Tim has said, it is a complicated process and we're in the insurance marketplace. Uh, we'll actually be in the marketplace next week. Uh, as we move into September, it's usually our um, our process that we begin negotiations with insurance companies as we move September. Prior to um, uh, a budget indication and a budget forecast for insurance based on what we know about the insurance market, what we know about what's happening uh, in relation to catastrophic losses throughout the world and particularly in the United States and how that has an impact on coverage. And what I do want to say just opening up is that um, this is probably one of the worst insurance markets that we've seen in years. We've had these ups and downs over time. And I know at Rossmore, um, looking back at the rates and the premiums that have been charged over time, that's obviously very, very clear that that's happened. And, um, but usually what happens is we have a spike and then we have a period of time when rates have reduced. What we've seen in the last several years because of a number of conditions, rates have gone up and continued to go up at a time when the insurance uh, industry is sort of constricting the amount of coverage that they're, they're willing to provide. Um, I, I'm not sure if, uh, I hope you're seeing me. We see you. I'm we seeing Tim. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we see you. Uh, we don't see a presentation yet, but that's fine. Just keep. Would John, okay. would you like me to put the presentation up? Um, I think it would be good. I'm, I'm, uh, it would be good to do that right now. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't want to get into uh, every specific detail in this presentation, but I thought that it would be important as we move toward uh, the forecast for the coming year. Uh, just to give you an overview of the 
uh, insurance marketplace and how it reflects um, the potential of insurance costs for Rossmark. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, I've, um, okay, here we go. Uh, put some things together and as I said, I'm gonna go through these quickly. Um, you can go back and, and um, go over it and if you have questions, I'm certainly here to answer it. But what I want you to know is that uh, over time, the insurance industry underwriting results have really deteriorated. And that's mostly because of catastrophic losses that really started in 2018 and have run through 2019 and clearly into 2020. Living in the Bay Area, we are all aware of what's going on around us right now. And of course, I get up this morning and I read about um, the, the storms and the hurricane in, in Louisiana, uh, you know, the largest hurricane, the biggest storm to hit that particular area in 100 years. So that's the environment that we're living in, and it's having a direct effect across the board in the insurance marketplace, but particularly when it comes to property insurance. And property insurance, particularly for a complex like Rossmore, uh, the insurers who do participate um, rely very heavily on reinsurance uh, to share the risk that they're willing to take. And the reinsurers, although there's financial capacity uh, out there, the willingness to use that financial capacity to fill in uh, coverage gaps and so forth, uh, it has really become more restrictive. So it makes the job a lot more difficult. And as I said, we've had uh, a, a number of, um, of um, catastrophic losses. And the one thing I want to mention, and I know this has come up in the past uh, several years as we've gone through this, is that wildfire has now become a part of everybody in California's insurance premiums. Uh, the we see it every year. We're going through it right now. We're going through early. Uh, usually it's October. We start to see this. We're in the middle of August. And um, this has an impact on everybody in California. I think, you know, I just got my homeowner's insurance renewal for September, and it's gone up 12%. And for no other reason that there's a loading in the rates for property to, to cover this wildfire loss. And at the same time, the insurance companies are looking much more closely to where properties are located. And although most of Rossmore is down in the valley, we are surrounded by, you know, forested areas and wooded areas and so forth. And that also has an impact. You're doing everything you can. And we've had a lot of good information from the staff uh, that we've transmitted to the insurance company about what you're doing to minimize uh, fire loss in Rossmore. But again, these are the general issues that um, uh, affect everybody. And then we can get to the insurance industry, habitational risks. Uh, the insurance industry's experience with habitational risk is uh, worse than uh, it is with other types of property. And that has, beyond the factors I've mentioned, it has to do with, you know, the kitchen fires and the barbecue fires. And, uh, you know, we don't see as much from smoking as we used to, but uh, residential properties are just more susceptible to loss than uh, other types of property. And it's all reflected in our marketing efforts and the pricing that comes back. So we go to the next slide. Okay. Next slide. Not happening. Well, uh, what, what I wanted to emphasize on the next slide was that um, the, yeah, uh, there are specific things that uh, are affecting Rossmore. And as we get into those, um, you have to understand that when the um, when the marketplace has uh, problems as far as um, catastrophic results and so forth, they then look at very you know specifics. And the first thing is that there's a high concentration of values. We estimate it's probably a little bit on the low side, but we're estimating for insurance purposes 1.3 billion dollars of insurance, all located in a, in a general area. And um, get my 
So everything is located in one general area and it, it requires us to get a lot of, in, <laughs> let's see, maybe we can get back to the slide. Sorry, I'm not controlling it. <laughs> okay, here we go. High concentration of values um, in a single area. And that means we have to get a lot of insurance companies involved in that. And it's not the kind of thing that you can go to, say, the Travelers or um, uh, Hartford or even companies like State Farm and so forth to say, we want to insure these homeowners associations. It is a difficult task because of the fact that if anybody were to take on that risk, they would, they would have a huge exposure and they would have to buy all kinds of reinsurance and it just makes that process very difficult. The other thing is that we've got older buildings um, that don't fit the current code. So if we have catastrophic loss, we have to rebuild buildings uh, reflecting current codes for, for things like seismic and ADA and sprinklers and so forth. So that's going to add cost. Um, we do have um, a uh, lack of sprinkler buildings and, you know, although in the allocation, the sprinkler buildings get a credit and those who uh, are not sprinkler pay more, but it still is a factor overall because of the overwhelming number of buildings and percentage of value that's not sprinkler. And then we run into the specifics of uh, Rossmore's specific loss history. And um, when we get into the, some further slide, we'll see that specifically. But the problem at Rossmore is not one of frequency, but it is one of severity. When we do have a loss, it's not unusual to have a seven-figure loss. And uh, our two largest claims have been uh, up over $5 million. So all the insurance companies are very you know, aware of that. We have had a great year this year. We've had no claims. We've had one, but it was under the deductible and the uh, owner's uh, insurance is, is essentially taking care of that. But we hold our breath because you know, we would like to see a full year without any claims because it'll help mitigate our situation. But all the insurers that we work with understand that Ross Moore is susceptible to the large severe loss that happens maybe twice a year, go a year without one, come back the next year. So there is that, um, that pattern. Now we can uh, you know, go to this uh, chart, which is up here. And that's what Tim was referring to, uh, the uh, colored chart. Go back one. Um, if you look at it on the left <laughs> and we see the excess liability, the umbrella, the primary liability, it goes up to 50 million, over a million, prime insurance that involved all the mutuals, uh, equipment breakdown and so forth. There's three columns. Paid in this uh, 1.3 replacement. And there are 35 separate insurers on that chart. There, that includes, uh, we have a um, reliance on the London market. Gallagher, the way this works is that I and my team are responsible for de de delivering this process, product. But we work with a uh, specialist within the Gallagher organization. She's in Los Angeles. And her specialty is large risk property, high value. And in turn, the two of us work with our office in London where we access not only Lloyd's but other foreign insurers. So when Gallagher goes to the market, we go to the global market and we come back with this kind of, of scenario. And you can see that you know, the, the first $50 million of coverage is what we call the primary. And that is really spread up with a lot of different sources as each company is willing to come on, but they don't want to put up a huge amount of coverage for the risk. So they, they say, I'll take, you know, seven and a half percent of 25 million excess of 25. And this is why it's so complicated to put this together. And even at the end of last year, as we were finishing up, uh, a few of those uh, boxes up in the upper levels uh, have been um, were difficult to place, and we actually went for a couple of weeks with those uncovered. So it is it is quite a process. 
one thing that I uh, do want to mention is in addition to this, um, there are reinsurers, reinsurers. And if you look at in the middle, there's a big blue box that says Great American Insurance Company. And uh, Great American at one time took that entire $70 million. Uh, it was actually $100 million. And they, they cut back last year because they could not get reinsurance to fill out the risk. They were willing to take a certain amount and they needed to get reinsurance. And they couldn't get the amount of reinsurance and they, they had to um, cut back. And so then it means we have to place coverage in other spots. The, the, the next layer up was Homeland, and that's like probably the last one that I'll mention, is uh, the, the underwriter there who worked with him and he's been on your risk for at least 10 years. And he was getting feedback from uh, reinsurers and un- ins- above him that said that he was getting less for his participation than the, the insurers that were above him. So immediately he calls and says, I can't participate unless I get more money because I'm taking a greater risk than the people ahead of me and they're getting more money. So it really is, uh, uh, it's a global situation and it's the kind of thing where everybody knows what's going on because there are so many participants and so many reinsurers that it drives that situation. Uh, Two things I wanna mention before we look at the, the premium projection and the losses. Two things I wanna mention is that um, you know, you have a $250,000 deductible that was essentially driven by the market. Um, we do not anticipate that being increased unless we can show that there's a financial savings to do that. So we're going to look at that sort of issue of self-insurance as to should you take a higher deductible for a premium saving. Uh, what I do know is that 100000 and a 250000 there has been a significant savings over the years if, against what you would be paying if you had a $10,000 deductible, which is common for homeowners associations, but not for this kind of uh, placement. Uh, it, small individual homeowners associations may have a 10000 but we use that as a benchmark, and the savings was significant, and uh, MOD gives us information on all the dollars that are spent with below the deductible, so we have a good sense of that. And when we do our final presentation, we will show all of that information to help you make those comparisons. And then the other point is, is that once we we have 1.3 billion, which is based on the estimated replacement cost, FHA, Fannie Mae regulations are that if you have a complex like Rossmore, which is allowed to buy a master policy, <clears throat> that that limit has to either be equal to um, half of the insured value, insured value or 150% of the largest mutual. And it ran out the numbers, and it under both scenarios, it comes out to about 750000 or so. What the savings would be estimating that about 400,000. So it's really not as significant uh, because most of the premium is in those lower layers. But we are definitely going to provide those kinds of options as uh, our goal is to get our final proposal together at the end of November presented to to, uh, Tim and and, and Rick and the rest of the staff uh, during the first week of December. But we continue to provide updates as we move through the process aware of where we're going and where, you know, particular issues are and so forth. So I think there's two other slides uh, that are important and I will look at those. And I, again, I don't want to dwell on a lot of numbers, but what I do want to just point out is that this is the property and loss history going back to 2015. So including this year, it's, it's six years. Um, Insurance companies don't factor in the most current year because it's still in process. But if I go back, if I look at that year, uh, the top layer, which is losses above 100,000 up to 50 million, which is what we call the primary layer, and that's where most of the premium is, that um, the premium, if uh, the pure premium, the total is 11 million, 354, and losses after um, the deductible go over to the right is uh, uh, 9,524. And that's an 84% loss ratio. 
which is not good. It's not really d disastrous, but at the same time, it's not good because property insurers are looking for about a 60% loss ratio. But that 84% loss ratio includes the current year with 3.7 million in premium and um, no losses. So if I take that out, that that loss ratio is approaching 150%. So that's when I say, when we look at the Ross Moore specific history, it has an impact and that's what the underwriters are looking at. And that's another reason why coverages or um, premiums increased in the last two years beyond the general market and why certain insurers have cut back because they had suffered some of those, those losses. So the trend is good for this year, but as you can see, we've had only, in the last six years, we've only had one other year where we have not had significant claims. If I go back several years before, there's other large losses, including the first year we came on running springs. So I just put this up. You can study the numbers if you want, but I just want to emphasize the point that the insurers as a whole, at least the primary insurers are not making money. There's people way up on the excess they're putting up their capacity and they meet our requirements for Fannie Mae and so forth, but they have not had a loss. They're just sort of pricing it on the marketplace. But when we get down in those layer, lower layers, they definitely look at the loss history. So the last slide that I have is um, our projection. And you can see we have the 2020 actual and what we're projecting for 2021, the comparison and the percentage of difference and we're looking at overall about a 32% increase in insurance, most of which is um, in the property. And I do wanna say one thing, because again, we're looking at this as a projection and we wanna create something that's realistic. We don't wanna get into lowballing it for budget purposes and then find out the rates go way up. But what we're hoping is we continue to have good experience this year. You know, Rossmore is a January 1st renewal, GRF program. And in 2020, beginning with January, premiums have gone up significantly across the board in the market for property insurance compared to 20, 2019. Well, Rossmore already got the big in January of 2020. So as, you know, these rate increases catch up with other insurers throughout the year, that when we start talking about the 2021 renewal, you know, those increases will be mitigated because the insurers have all received these large increase in premium uh, this year. So that's one of the good points that we think is in our favor is that we're now going to be looking at a 2021 renewal when we hope that things are going to moderate. So you were on the front end of the big increases last year. We hope that you're on the front end of, of the mitigated increases in that are all timing of the market. Um, but, you know, I just, as I said, I just don't want to be, um, you know, painting a rosy picture when, you know, everything, the whole thing could collapse in the next month if, you know, depending on ha what happens with the storms. Uh, additional fires in California and other places in the West. Um, we're just at that mercy right now. And as I've said before, I've been doing this for, for a long time. I have not seen a market as old as this insurance market in 1985. And, you know, that's what, 35 years. Um, there's been ups and downs sustained with large increases in the last. And I remember 85, 86, we fought and you know rates were going up people were dropping coverage they were their limits just to stay afloat but you know you have a lot of issues of you know the fiduciary responsibility for the mutuals and so forth so we're going to look at a number of different options um, I think at the end of the day the program is going to look pretty much like it is but we don't want to uh, you know ignore any opportunity for you to potentially assume more risk and reduce costs. So that's the end of my pr presentation. I went through it pretty quickly. Uh, I'm certainly open for questions. Any questions for John? Carl and then Dwight. <clears throat> yes, uh, 
I was wondering about develop, you know, setting up a third ent entity to mm -hmm. start uh, moving toward a self-insuring <laughs> and phase in by uh, putting together a fund to uh, cover some of our uh, this and moving to a higher deductible. Is yeah. that an option we're exploring or not? Yes. Yes, in fact, we're looking at a couple of different ways to do that. Uh, it's preliminary right now. I, I had um, I received some information, uh, oh, about six months ago from another Gallagher group about a potential program, but it really was just sort of funding the, the deductible. And I think what you're talking about is increasing the deductible, maybe putting a higher deductible per occurrence with an aggregate that says if we hit that aggregate then the insurance company comes back in i think that's you know a good way to have a self-insurance program you can do that directly or you can do that through uh, a uh, mechanism called a captive insurance company and i won't get into all the specifics about that but doing where we have a large fund usually if an insurance company recognize a self-insurance fund, uh, they're willing to put up a front that allows us to give the lenders, in, you know, um, the information they need with a lower deductible, but the insurance company knows that it's it's collateralized by your fund. So it may say take some time to get there. But we are, lo we are looking at a couple of different options. I, I spent a couple hours on a webinar on Tuesday, uh, specifically on this issue with the idea of how could it apply to Rossmo. So we, and that may take some time to develop, but we want to give you the parameters of what it would look like. And then you can decide how do you implement that over time. Right. So uh, John, good to see you. Uh, 8.1 million. Good to see you too. Yeah. A uh, huge number, John, yeah. 8.1 million. Yes. Uh, and up significantly over the years here. But but and uh, mm -hmm. very interesting when you show the cost per manor, it's basically a hundred dollars a month in the coupon, uh, which when you break it down like that, it doesn't sound like that much. But do you have any benchmarks against other uh, entities like ours oh. as to what that looks like? Are we are we out of yeah, the you know, it's, range? No, you know it's interesting right now. Um, I mean, I. All I all I have done in my career has been multifamily housing, so I could you know could provide a number of different scenarios. But usually, the you know I can take one of my apartment clients and see you know we got two billion dollars in value, but it's spread out. You know here we have it all concentrated. But there's an interesting thing happening right now because Laguna Hills, um, Rossmore um, type organization down there is. Big numbers so much as we just trade about the problem, and I know that you know down there they're really and they're looking to increase their limits, but they're running into the same issues. And, I, and um, you know, I know that um, we're, we're sort of benchmarking together to see what happens. They have a, it's a different scenario there. They have one really large building and then a lot of smaller ones. But um, they're about three times the value. They're they're pretty much underinsured right now, and they're going to have to increase values. But if you look on a per unit basis, the numbers are running about the same. But this is more anecdotal right now than it is, you know, specific empirical information. But um, you know, I, I think that if we we check through our network for similar situations, I think we're going to see this. Um, it's just. Um, it's it's not unusual, but I know that you know the one that I know of that's as close to Rossmore as it could be is dealing with the same issues that you are, and I, I believe their risk managers also talked to Rick, and so you know they're out trying to figure out how do how, how do we overcome the same situation. Kathleen, <clears throat> well, unfortunately, um, I feel that the future is not what the past has been. Um, and we're, we're not going to go back to, uh, you know, even if we had no fires in Rossmore for a few years, the insurance industry overall, I mean, right now we have California burning and 
a huge storm in um, in uh, Louisiana. So uh, you know, climate change is changing things. So do you feel, what is your thoughts on the future? Uh, I know you have a lot of information on the past, but I, I'm not sure that that's uh, gonna help us with the future. And, um, and I think that Carl's idea and that you've looked into with some sort of a self-insurance for a higher deductible is um, something that could help. But um, what, just what are your thoughts about the climate change and what, how it's affecting the insurance industry? Climate change is a, is a really major topic in the industry looking long term because what we're experiencing right now, I think the insurance industry believes that it's just going to magnify unless things turn to some degree. So as I said earlier about wildfires having an impact on everybody's insurance in California, these things, once they become part of the rating process, they stay. You know, it's, you know, I don't see... I can see ups and downs in the market, but what I think is happening is, you know, we had a protracted period of really low rates and now things have moved up and maybe they've gone beyond the level that we feel is necessary. And I think when that, and I'm going to give you a sort of a two part answer here, but when that happens, what happens in the short term is the insurers are trying to recover. So they bump up their premiums significantly. And then new markets come into the market and they say, well, we don't have to come in at a low rate because everybody else is up here. And you know they start to make money at that level. So we have that immediate impact where everybody tries to recover. And then the market will start to, to, to loosen, but it's going to be relative because it's not going to go back to where it was five years ago. It, it, the ups and downs will start at a much higher level. And we've seen, I've seen that happen in other parts of the country, like Texas and Louisiana and Florida and so forth. When I, you know, 10 years ago, my colleagues at Gallagher, they were all, you know, emails and, and, and uh, uh, bulletins going out, you know, how, it helped me because they were running into the problems that we have in California today. They still have those problems. And now all of a sudden, California is in that same boot. So my th thinking long term is we will continue to see ups and downs, but we're going to see it at a much higher level. And I don't see rates going back to where we're, the beginning of that chart that I showed. So I, you're right. I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, it's, it, it's now become a fact of life and uh, our starting point is much higher than it was five years ago. Dale. If that, I, I think John, that most of us uh, here could understand the last couple of years with the, the fires, um, in California affecting things, I was blown away when I saw that you had to, you, that you included the explosion in, in, by, in Beirut, my Lord. Uh, and it, that enters into this also, that far away. Yeah, and, and, and I think you're breaking, I, I think I got your question. Um, I had, there was some interference the joys of Zoom. But um, yes, um, it's a global market. And when you look at the number of companies that have um, participated, and, uh, you know, it used to be that we had all these, uh, we still have insurers that really specialize only in the United States. But when you start getting into the point where you need to um, get in reinsurance from the global market, all these things have an impact. And you know, the explosion in Beirut, I, a lot of people didn't, um, you know, wouldn't immediately connect that with insurance in the United States. But as, you know, we start to get into this layer of reinsurance, reinsurers that are covering risk in the United States also covered risk in Beirut. And I read an article, and I'm on top of this stuff a lot. And it, 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 you do this for 45 years, it, it becomes interesting <laughs> at some point. But I, I always, when there's these catas catastrophic things, I want to find out what's happening. And most of the damage there was in an area that was heavily insured. There were hotels, restaurants. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it, it was a highly commercialized area. So that $8 billion, some of that $8 billion is probably going to be paid out by insurers that are on the Rossmore account. 
So that's why it is a global thing. It doesn't have as much impact as the California wildfires, but it has an impact, particularly when it's one more large event tacked on to all of the rest of these. Carl? Yes, the other thing that concerns me, and one of the things I'm thinking of, of that would help if we could have a fund to cover, you know, a higher de deductible and make it more cata uh, more of a catastrophic coverage is it was my understanding that we had problem getting people who were willing to insure. And I think, uh, John, correct me if I'm wrong, that if we had this higher deductible and became more of a catastrophic uh, insurance, that uh, we would be we would run less risk of being of not being able to find insurers to cover us. No, that's exactly true. And that's why I think it's important at this point. And usually self-insurance programs, and again, it, it, it's going to come down to the cost and how much you're willing to fund, but that'll ultimately be your decisions. And you, you know, but we will provide all the, the uh, uh, tools that you can use to make that decision. But self-insurance programs usually grow out of this kind of situation, either a very difficult marketplace um, a number of years ago, workers' comp was really hard, and large and large clients went to all kinds of self-insured or self-funded programs because they were paying a fortune. Smaller ones didn't have that ability, but I think Rossmore is at the size that you could do it if you're willing to take on the risk. But if we went from um, 250,000 deductible to a five million dollar self-insured layer, it eliminates all of those players and now we're in a totally different scenario. So you're, I, I agree with you that, and I've seen it in the past that most self-insurance programs come out of some type of critical situation. The first program that Gallagher ever put together, self-insurance was not a big issue. Uh, and this was back in the uh, late 50s. I remember this, I was going to Catholic school in St. Monica's, there was a fire it, the uh, Archdiocese of Chicago, and I don't know, you know, 100 kids got killed in a school fire. And the Archdiocese of, of, of Chicago couldn't get insurance. And Gallagher stepped up and put together a self-insurance program. It was one of the first ones, but it came out of a disaster. And it came out of a difficult situation. And I think that's where you are right now. Tim? So Carl, and, and to the rest of the board and the community. Uh, the numbers that John showed you are the, is the package policy. That's the cost that GRF and the mutuals all share in. Mm -hmm. So those, those numbers that he showed you are not GRF's cost. They are the cost for the whole community. And most of the property insurance is paid for by the mutuals. So when you talk about creating uh, say a larger deductible or a larger, um, even a self-insured model. The, the question here is not just what GRF wants to do. It really is driven by the decisions that the mutuals would have to make. So the mutuals would have to decide that they want to insure themselves at that level, have to assess themselves to cover that, build that into their coupon. GRF's part of this is a, is a much, much smaller number. I'm, uh, Rick could probably, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but Rick might, if he's still on, could let us know. But I just want to make sure that it's clear that that premium is not on GRF's budget. It, we have a very small part of that. Most of it is paid for by the mutuals because that's where most of the property value exists. Kathleen? Um, so do we need to make a motion to, uh, to have a renewal of the insurance broker contract with uh, Gallagher? Yes. Then I make that motion. So one year extension, okay. Carl? Second that motion. Okay, any other discussion or questions for John, Dwight? I had a question about that renewal. And, and, and maybe it's just a typo, but on the Fourth Amendment, I guess it's document 11C11, um, it talks about 2020 and 2021. What, what year are we talking about with this renewal? 2021. There were a couple of typos and we corrected them, but something may not have gotten through. I, I, before we sign that, obviously we'll correct it, but we're proposing for 
finishing, we're under contract this year. It runs out at the end of the year. We're going to be marketing the business and this is projecting uh, our services into 2021. Okay. It's in the fee uh, paragraph. I think there's a typo there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll make sure that that's correct. And then it'll be signed. At one point we, we, we have made a reduction in the fee. It's $10,000. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's just a, a recognition that it's a tough market and it's about a 5% reduction in our um, income. Carl. Yes, I just want to thank you for that reduction. Everything else is going up. Yes, uh, it's, it's certainly <laughs> giving me. Well, go ahead. No, I appreciate that. I, we, we, we know, uh, like I said, it's not a huge amount, but our, our total cost of in all of Rossmore's insurance really is a small percentage, but it is something that's visible, and I appreciate that. I want to want to echo that. Uh, I I never dreamed insurance could be so complicated until I got involved with GRF and I've seen your presentation. So uh, kudos for all the uh, interesting and uh, the the puzzle that you have to put together and that you've so far accomplished. So any other discussion or okay? okay all in favor? Uh, well, let's do a roll call vote. Okay. Kelso? Yes. Stumpo? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Walker? Yes. Adams? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Kikuchi? Yes. Thank you. Okay, John, thanks. Um, we'll Thank you all. And, another uh, year to work with you. Appreciate that. Well, I appreciate that as well, and um, we, we, we'll um, we'll deliver you the best package that's going to be available, and we will give you some options. And I'm looking forward to it. So, thank you all. Great. Okay, uh, let's take a, a break. We'll come back at 11:15, so uh, eight minutes. Um, see you back in eight minutes. Okay, everybody's back. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order again. Um, moving on to unfinished business. We have policy 604.0. Our council has recommended that go back to the policy committee. Um, do we need a motion for that? Or I think it just, if we, I don't think so. So, okay. Um, unless anyone has any objections, I think We'll just send that back to the policy committee and move on to the next. Uh, consider approving policy 201.6, the uh, attendance at meetings. And do we have any discussion about that? That is, this is the policy that uh, sort of codifies our electronic meeting, uh, Zoom meetings, uh, clarifies circumstances in which we can use that and puts that into our policies. Any uh, discussion? Okay. Uh, I think this is our second reading of that, right? So do we have a uh, motion to approve, D Dwight? So moved. I second. Okay, any uh, further discussion? Okay, roll call vote, please. Kelso. Yes. Stumfeld. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Walker. Yes. Adams. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Brown. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Kikuchi. Yes. Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to the um, the golf course. Uh, we've been addressing this every month. Would the golf committee um, present a, uh, not really a petition, a, um, a 
they passed a motion to recommend that we go back to normal hours. Uh, does anyone have any um, thoughts about this topic? Kathleen? <clears throat> um, I have asked for, but it seems that it's um, pretty difficult to get the numbers of people walking. And I know for the past two weeks, the numbers have been um, down for golf and everything because of the heat and the smoke. Um, but I think that's part of our consideration is um, if it's not being used by walkers very much, then it, they, it should go back to golf. Um, and I don't know how to get that information about how many people are, are using it for walking. Jeff? Mark, do you have that? Uh, I know you've been doing some informal counts. Do you have that? Are you on there, Mark? Yeah, I, I am back on. Uh, yeah, the marshals for a while were keeping count. This was before the last two weeks. So I think we can all agree the last two weeks, you probably can't keep count of much of anything. Even, even golfers were down, although... We did have quite a bit of golf at that time of day on the 18 old golf course, um, the one that was open. But uh, before this, before the two weeks, we saw a significant drop in the number of people walking on the golf courses in the evenings. Um, whether it was warm or not, uh, we had numbers where I would have the marshals go out and count anywhere between uh, in, a, in a half hour's time on the golf course, six to eight people uh at a time uh, using the facility i sent a video to jeff uh on a friday afternoon that i closed and there was virtually no one on my video as i was out there i think we had one person on that video um so it has dropped i think john's analysis was kind of interesting i didn't write it but i thought it was very good in his uh information he sent that is that people have adjusted their schedules in so many different ways, haven't we all had to adjust our schedules? And I think that the the walking was a wonderful thing to do while we were closed, and even immediately after things started to reopen, because people were trying to get rid get used to the new COVID experience. But at this time, people have managed their schedules to where uh, they can either walk later, or the Mondays are still very popular. I come in on Mondays, even though we're closed. I see a lot of people uh, walking that day, but the evenings are are not being used. Ken, was that Ken or Tim, Bob? Ken. Ken. <laughs> yeah, I, I personally, I think it's kind of premature to do away. Uh, with the walkers time after four o'clock, uh, at least entirely, maybe there's something in between. We could um, increase the golfers by an hour or two, but I think it's premature to remove that uh, that benefit for the walkers as long as the fitness center is still closed. Tim? It's anecdotal, uh, but um, I try to get out a couple, two, three days a week and drive around the golf course. I think I've mentioned this before. And uh, I typically will, and so I just do a visual count as to how many people I can actually see. And I, as I make my way around the golf course, I'm in my car. I stop at different points, try to make sure I'm not double counting people. And I probably am in some because it's I am looking at it from a distance. But I would, and so the time I'm typically doing this is sometime between 5.30 and 7 p.m., um, probably averaging between 6 and 6.30. That's when I'm typically there. So what I have seen, seen during that specific time is at the low end, 12 people, and at the high end, uh, I think I counted 22 one day. Only once did I ever get a number that high. Um, more typically, it's right around a dozen, 12 to 15 people or so. That's what I see. But again, that's a point in time. And what we're talking about is 4 p.m. till, you know, through the evening. So you're not going to have 100 people out there to generally all at once. So it's at any given point in time, it seems like, as Mark reported, the numbers are fairly low. Um, but I also know that we've gotten quite a bit of correspondence, continue to get correspondence from people who are both appreciative of having the ability to walk on the course and probably lately even more correspondence from golfers who are anxious to have that time to play golf. Bob, if it's okay, I will add the other side of the story. And the fact is that I can show my 
starting sheet in the evenings and from two o'clock when the Creekside closes until five o'clock each evening, we're generally full on the 18 old golf course. We are turning away play. There's no doubt about that. I cannot facilitate all the people that like to play in the afternoon on one golf course. There's also the added that some people have simply given up. They're not playing because their golf course, what they feel is their golf course, the Creekside is closed. So they're the silent group that simply isn't participating in golf because they play evenings on Creekside and that's not available. And uh, they're not gonna join the, the masses on the, on the 18, that's not what they wanna do. So um, the other side of the picture is that we, we have golfers that would play that just are not given that ability. Dwight and then Carl. So I, I just want to point out the financial part of this, although that's not the only way I look at it. But, um, you know, we're turning down, as Mark said, we're turning down revenue and revenue serves to what we're currently experiencing is increasing a surplus that then benefits every resident within Rossmore. And I just wonder if it's not time to think about maximizing our revenue on the golf course, uh, even though there's a sacrifice to a few uh, residents who enjoy that walking time in the afternoon. Carl? Yes, I'm wondering about changing the time from four to six, still allowing people to walk in the evenings. I know people have complained about dinner time, but dinner times are, are uh, adjustable and it would be a, you know, these are summer times when uh, that will still give people a lot of daylight hours to walk. It, it'll be effectively a compromise. And I think as Tim brought out once, we know uh, the compromise is good when both parties are dissatisfied. Dale? I totally endorse what Dwight said. Uh, Sue? endorse what Dwight, Dwight said also. We John. need money. Yeah, I'm just wondering how many tee times um, uh, are, would otherwise be available on Creekside if it was opened up? We, uh, we, we closed the last tee time right now is 152. There are eight tee times per hour. So you're talking about the two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, so four hours. We essentially close the golf course for one third of the day right now. If you look under in the, in the staff report under the financial impact, it, it talks about the possible number of, of rounds uh, per hour for the uh, Creekside course when we're closed. Seems to me, I remember we talked about 6500 to $7,000 a month uh, is what we were estimating. That's correct, Bob. Yeah, I think that's the number we were using. So, um, I mean, that's fairly minor in the overall scheme of things. It's not insignificant, obviously. Kathleen? Yeah, I, I think that um, we shouldn't make this decision based on the finances because it, it isn't that large. And um, they, there is a lot of golf being uh, you know, played. The, the number of people out playing golf because there's not other things to do has been great. Um, but I think we should make it more on the consideration of um, are there enough walkers out there to make it worthwhile to um, eliminate the golfers. So, you know, if you have, <clears throat> let's say, 40 people a day walking, and that would be, you know, if at any point in time there's 12, it's just let's just pull a number out then you have um how many golfers uh are not able to play because there are 40 people in the evening walking and um and i also i know it's an adjustment but i kind of agree with carl's thing move it up to six instead of four and um and that gives more it's sort of a a split and um and i think that it would be a little bit of an adjustment but uh, it might be worth making the adjustment to get the walkers uh, off the golf course until six o'clock. Um, but anyway, so that's my sort of my my thought is that 
how many golfers would be on there versus the 40 walkers that are on there in an evening? And yeah. maybe Mark can answer that. Sorry, Dale? Mark, if we did, went back to the six, how many additional golfers could be accommodated by um, by having it start at six instead of four? That means that we'd have uh, two more hours of tee times because we our last tee time would then become the 352 time to clear the golf course by six. So that's two additional hours. At 16 times, we would fill a good portion of those. So you're looking at about 60 something golfers potentially. I mean, it's probably more like around 50, um, but you, you you could do a 50 more rounds. I think that's probably a, a thumbnail <laughs> number I'd be comfortable with that's possible. So it just seems to me then that um, I would be, I could vote for uh, six o'clock, but I would not continue to vote for four o'clock. Sue? Um, changing the time, and I like the six o'clock, but what would it entail to get everybody to know that? Um, I, I still have personally seen somebody hit with a golf ball and it is not a pretty picture. So uh, the, my concern is uh, those who are used to work, walking at four, how do we get the, you know across to them that they can't start till six? Well, that's why we have Nixle in the newspaper. Yeah. Neva? I was going to say, put out a Nixle warning and maybe put it out for several days just to get everybody's attention. Okay, any more discussion? Does anyone want to make a motion or Ken? You're muted. It's a silent motion. I don't read lips. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna make the motion itself. But I kind of agree with Dale that six o'clock uh, having the golfers off the course at six o'clock uh, would be a good compromise. That uh, as it is now, the golfers have eight and a half hours on that uh, Creekside golf course, and two more hours would. Uh, make it 10 and a half hours. So I think uh, Dale's idea was a great, a good compromise. Carl? I move that we change the hours for walking to start at six o'clock as opposed to four. I second. I second. Okay, could we specify that this isn't gonna take effect tomorrow, but it's gonna be maybe next week? Uh, Mark, how long do you think uh, we would want some advance notice to get if we do it after the Rossmore news comes out next week, that would be a help. What about a week? What do you think? Yeah, I think that's just fine. Yeah. So maybe uh, maybe we uh, maybe we do it uh, even um, after uh, Labor Day, the uh, the seventh, which is a uh, so the the eighth of September would be fine because that would uh, give plenty of time and be after the holiday weekend. Yeah, and we we can't get anything in the paper next week. Uh, we're past the deadline. It would be in the paper uh, in the week after next. I think Ann is going to say something. So uh, one quick thing, we can get it in next week's paper. Um, Kathy's doing the story on the board meeting. We'll make sure that this is the lead of the story. So it will be in next week's paper. So Mark, you sure you want to go, you want to miss the holiday weekend there? Well, I, I, again, I, I was thinking about the walkers there. They, they may have family in that want to walk and have a plan for that. Um, but I, whatever, I'll leave it to you, to you to decide. Well, either one's fine with me. It could be the first or the or the eighth. Uh, I think uh, Tuesday is a good start, giving the Monday information. So whatever you decide. Okay, Sue, and then Carl. I think that um, giving a, just a little bit longer to be sure in the newspaper. There's at least two in bold headlines. So I like what Mark suggests. I mean, Mark's a pro over there, and he's given us a suggestion that I think we ought to take. Okay, Carl. Yes, and I think the other thing is we should put some signage out on the paths. Okay, so we're going to start this uh, the day after uh, the holiday. Um, so roll call vote, please. Certainly. Kelso? Yes. Stumpo? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Walker? Yes. Adams? Yes. Anderson? Yes. 
Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Kikuchi? Yes. Okay, passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, let's make sure to get the Nixels out, um, several of them about this. So I'm going to uh, modify the agenda again, and I'm going to move the board review of finalized goals until after we have the uh, report on the bus system, since one of the proposed goals has to do with the bus system. So new business, um, we have the, finally, the contract with the, uh, to repair the creek. Uh, Paul, would you give us the details? Okay, yes. Uh so I think everybody knows we have two areas of the creek that have been eroding steadily over the years, one at the uh, Buckeye Tennis Courts and one at the uh, what are now the Pickleball Courts. Uh, both areas are, are really getting very close to causing damage. So luckily we have obtained all of our permits. We did go out to bid. We solicited three bids and the low bid came in at $120,100. On top of that, we have a, a large number of fees associated with biologist reports, creek monitoring, landscape work. One of those monitoring, uh, creek monitoring reports goes out 10 years. And I received an email from Rick yesterday stating that that could not be capitalized and that would have to go onto the operating budget. So that would reduce the amount of the approval from by forty thousand dollars. So instead of asking for three hundred thousand, I think the uh, motion should be amended to make it two hundred and sixty thousand. Did I get that right, Rick? Yes, you did. Okay. Any questions about this from anyone? Dwight. I'm just wondering what impact this has on residents, uh, this construction, and, and specifically on the pickleball courts. What, what are the plans, or, or maybe there is no dislocation because of that? Uh, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure on that, Dwight, but I believe they're going to access from the other side and not, not have to close the pickleball court down, but I, I can't be 100% sure of that. Dale? Um, is some of the work uh, also on the surface of the court? Is there cracking or anything like that, uh, Paul? Not not as part of this job. That would oh. have to be something separate. Oh, okay. This is strictly and, creek repair. And also, I understand from a communication from you that uh, just so that people understand that this uh, repair at the, at the uh, pickleball court, at least, is going to include a retaining wall uh, well, to really minimize the possibility of, of uh, this happening again. Let me, I, yeah, it's, it's more complicated than that. And I'll try to screen share the design. It doesn't look very clear. Let me know if you can see it. Otherwise, can you guys even see that right here? Yes, but so let me let me try to walk you through it. So technically, the the retaining wall is this. It's a it's a basically a natural rock wall. The idea is as the flow comes down the creek, it hits the wall and pushes it away from from the creek. And then behind the creek is is basically a native backfill and. Uh, what they call willow revetment. And what that is, is they'll be planting uh, willow trees in the, the creek to hold it up. Our original design was a full gabion wall top to bottom, uh, but that's, that was kicked back at the last minute by the, uh, by the designers, uh, or excuse me, by the government agencies. And so this was the compromise that they came up with. So it's a very limited retaining wall blended with, with natural environment. Okay, any other questions about the project? Uh, Carl? Yes, I understand that uh, willow trees grow fairly large. And the other thing is a full mature willow tree will consume about 300 gallons 
which would reduce a day which reduces the amount of creek flow. Well, I don't think we're going to change the design now. Those may be interesting facts, but they're set in stone, literally, I think, at this point. So uh, yes, they are. And and we have done we have done willow revetment in a few other places on the creek. Uh, some successfully, some not successfully, but uh, I, I do understand your point, Carl, but as Bob said, this has been through the agencies and this is the what they've said we are allowed to do. Any other questions, Dwight? So just a quick follow-up, Paul. So, so if the pickleball courts are dislocated, I, I assume that they will have some place to play. That's more of a question for Jeff, but we, we haven't discussed that yet. <laughs> I think there might be some very interested pickleball players in that answer. We're, we're waiting to kind of see the final schedule for the construction project and see if there's days and minimal impact or if it's going to be more of a long term impact. Right now, we're not anticipating a significant impact. Uh, we have some options if it if it looks like it's going to be a longer term, which yeah, the, the whole uh, the whole project, both sites were estimating five weeks. So you figure two and a half weeks per site, roughly. But again, I don't I don't know that there's going to be that much impact to the pickleball courts if they come across from the other side, uh, the golf course side. It really shouldn't be too much. Okay. Any other discussion? Or I'd like to see someone with a motion here to Dwight. I move that we approve this project at $260,000 to be paid from the trust fund. I second. Okay, we probably should include the name of the uh, uh, company in there, but uh, any other discussion? All, uh, roll call vote, please. Also? Yes. Sumfell? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Walker? Yes. Adams? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Kikuchi? Yes. Thank you. I think we should all get up and do a little celebration dance after getting that time approved. <laughs> yeah. no, we still got to get contract down. approved. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Now on to uh, the buses. Jeff. Okay, so uh, Ralph Dennis is going to join me here, and we've got a, a PowerPoint presentation for you that we'll, we'll share. But the intent of this uh, presentation is to kind of go over the where the, the bus transportation was pre-COVID, uh, review some of the recommendations and findings from the uh, transit study that was done, the short-range transit study that was done uh, by Fair and Peers, back in, it started in 2017 and was presented in 2018 to the board. Okay, so here we go. Uh, go ahead and Ralph. So prior to, to COVID-19, just to, to start, our, our bus surface currently and back then operates 365 days a year. Uh, we run weekend service, weekday service. Uh, the service includes fixed routes, dial-a-bus, air transit. And our goal it really is to provide the, the Rossmore residents with an opportunity to stay independent while living here. Go ahead. Some of our uh, pre-COVID services, again, we ran Monday through Friday from 5.50 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. We have service on Saturdays and Sundays and holidays. Uh, those are 8.50 to 7.30. We ran four fixed routes, which included the downtown green line and then three routes uh, internally. Uh, we have a dial-a-bus system, a paratransit system. On the weekends, we run dial-a-bus only, uh, either three or four buses, depending on the day. Just to make a quick note, you're going to hear me say the term dial a bus, on demand, and paratransit. Uh, dial a bus and on demand will, will be somewhat interchangeable. Those are pretty much one in the same type of service. Right, go ahead, Ralph. 
again, back in 2016, we started a study, a short range transit study with a, a firm of Fair and Pierce. The study used data from 2016, uh, although it took place in 2017 and then in January of 2018, uh, we re reported out to the board the recommendations. Uh, some of the, the highlights, they, they did an overview of the uh, current operation. We developed some study goals, which I'll go over in a second. Uh, we did a survey of the residents, which we'll review. Uh, they had some recommendations for some new transit service and transitioning to more of an on-demand type setup. Go ahead. In 2016, uh, we had uh, five routes, fixed routes. We had the dial a bus and a paratransit service. The operation with the fixed routes was set up based on the philosophy that everybody's paying in. We wanted to provide equal access throughout the valley. Thus, we had uh, lines, including the white line, that was not as popular. Uh, most of our, our demand comes from uh, the south part of the valley, excuse me, north end of the valley. Uh, so we wanted to look at, should we change how we disperse the, the volume of service throughout? Um, we had about 100,000 riders and, and a budget of 1.1 million. Some of the study goals included increasing productivity overall, uh, enhancing the convenience of the system, and we'll talk about that quite a bit, and community and improving communication with our dispatch and bus drivers. The graph you see there shows a comparison with uh, County Connection. It's a, a little bit difficult to compare with County Connection because they're a publicly funded, very large operation, but you can see our passengers per hour on our system is at 7.4 back then, uh, cost per passenger, uh, $9.11, $9 cost per hour to operate, $67. These are all fairly consistent with the industry. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see one of the issues we wanted to address was the cost for paratransit service. And again, that's, that's more door-to-door -door bus service for individuals in, in a wheelchair or that needs specific assistance getting on and off the bus. Uh, the cost for that is significant per passenger trip uh, up to $43. Okay, go ahead. We did do a resident uh, survey during the, the course of the study. Some of the things that the, the residents indicated they really like about the system was the reliability. That's a, a benefit of fixed route. Uh, you know when the bus is gonna be there based on a schedule. You don't need to uh, call or make a reservation. You simply show up you know, when the bus is due to be there. The service area seemed to meet the, the people's needs. Uh, customer service, our bus drivers certainly know the passengers and vice versa. And they uh, liked having a bus system as an amenity. Some of the dislikes is the frequency. So our buses are on the roads, uh, bypassing every area about every 45 minutes, plus or minus. Uh, some people would like that more convenient. Travel time, uh, that is a big one that we wanted to address in this one. Currently our, our fixed route, they go in one direction uh, loop wise. Instead of going two different directions, we go one direction in our loops. That means that people could be on the bus up to 40 minutes if they're on a fixed route, depending on where they live. Uh, that's a pretty significant amount of time if you're just coming from, from Safeway. Uh, event service hours, that's basically if, if there's an event going on, a concert or something into the evening, the availability of buses to take you home, and then overall ease of use. Some of the things they noticed was uh, you know, half of the respondents use the bus service just only occasionally, well, 10% use it daily and rely on it. Most people that use the bus service use it because they have to, not, not by you know, choice, uh, but some do. A uh, quarter, 
quarter of the respondents did not drive or have access to a car. Half of the respondents in the survey own a smartphone and only 17% at that point had used a service such as Uber or Lyft. Go ahead. A big uh, portion of the study was focused on new transportation style services. Uh, they looked at the benefits of ride hailing services such as Uber and Lyft. Uh, also focused a little bit on on-demand delivery type services uh, such as Instacart and we see a lot of those now that maybe people can cut down on trips because they can use these types of services. And then they also had recommendations which we'll talk about for on-demand service uh, platforms. We started off with Translock and I'll get into that next. Some of the main recommendations from the, the study was to implement an on-demand service platform. Uh, they felt that this would reduce travel times throughout the valley and wait times, uh, increase ridership overall, improve our, our dispatch efficiency. And when we, we talk about dispatch, one of our concerns prior to the study was a lot of the phone calls would go directly to the bus driver while driving the bus. And that was a big safety concern. Uh, so using technology and improving dispatch was a, a big focus. Uh, provide more flexibility for the operation and integration with autonomous vehicles in the future. And we, we see that evolving, although it has slowed down with, with the COVID, but hopefully that will be, be coming around soon. Go ahead. Some of the next steps, uh, they recommended we initiate a pilot program for on-demand services during uh, times when we were using our dial -a bus uh, continue to educate and promote use of, of other transportation options and pursuing options uh, with shared mobility programs such as Uber and Lyft. Go ahead. Some of the things we did do uh, after the Fair and Pierce study um, in January of, of 2018, we applied for and received grant funding from Measure J, that's the county sales tax measure, to implement a pilot on-demand service as was recommended in the study. Um, the funding was used to uh, acquire a, a software program called Translock. Um, we removed the white line, which was our least productive fixed route line and replaced it with the on-demand. That did have a overall positive uh, impact on our ridership. Uh, the increase for the white line specifically, we were running, uh, the increase of 28 rides per day on the white line uh, compared to 12 previously. People that used to use the white line in some informal surveying uh, really expressed that they, they appreciated the on-demand uh, is more convenient. Go ahead. So one of the other things, as I mentioned before about dispatch, we improved the dispatch uh, communication. We added a second line uh, so people could more easily contact. We uh, added more hours in the, the office for dispatch by moving some um, existing staffing around. Uh, that in, increased convenience. Um, we added the, the app for the, the phone so people could make reservations on the phone with Translock. Go ahead. So post uh, Fair and Pierce studies, one of the things we found initially with the Translock is it, it didn't meet our needs based on our, our operation. One of the things we discovered was most, even with the app, very few people use the app. We didn't promote it a lot yet uh, during the, the pilot, but it wasn't used significantly. More people seem to want to call and make a reservation. The compatibility of the app reservations with phone-in reservations made it difficult for us to efficiently schedule rides. 
So one of the things we've done since then is we've converted to a, a new uh, platform called TapRide. And we converted to that just a few months ago, back in March. We're ready to do a, a significant rollout of that and, and our other services, uh, but due to the, the COVID impacts, that's been slowed. Uh, we do have a quick YouTube clip here uh, that Javier and, and Ralph put together in regards to how to use that. So this is part of our promotion that we intend to do. Uh, this is just a, a portion of that clip. Hey, go ahead and play that, Ralph. I can play. Can you add any volume to it, Ralph? So when you're you sharing, uh, I just want to let you know that when you're sharing audio and you're in, you have to uncheck a mark under share screen to share computer audio or else we won't be able to hear it. Okay, well, why don't we just go ahead and kill that, Ralph? Okay. All right. But as we've done with the pool reservation software and use of the app for the, the pool reservations, uh, we have put these videos on the website and it made them available. It shows you how to download the um, app on your smartphone. It shows you step-by-step step how to use them. Uh, we'll put instructions, printed instructions as well, uh, but it just helps promote the use of the app. And what we really wanna do as we've done with the, the pool reservations is increase use of, of the app. Uh, so we'll be rolling that out uh, in the next several months. Okay, why don't we go to the next slide there. Got it. Does she see it? You're, uh, you gotta go to the slideshow, show the full screen. Okay, now progress to the next. Okay, there we go. Um, you see prior to COVID-19, this is the volume that we were doing on uh, each of the, the lines. Uh, the green line downtown is the one that's funded by Measure J. Uh, the blue line is, is one of the more popular ones. Uh, you see that the white line we discontinued and replaced with on demand, which increased the, the ridership kind of in that area for that. Um, go ahead. Just wanted to do a little bit of overview of our, some of our funding. Uh, we started applying for Measure J funds, I believe back in 2014, 2013. And these are funds that come from the Contra Costa County Measure J, which is a, a sales tax measure that funds a whole slew of infrastructure and operational uh, projects throughout the county related to transit. A very, very, very small portion of that funding is line 20A has to do with senior and disabled transit uh, operated by uh, either nonprofits or segments of uh, agencies. So we apply for uh, that funding uh, Last year we had, it, usually it goes on a fiscal year, so it's, it's July through the end of June. Uh, we received funding for the Green Line uh, over a two year period for 198,000. The on-demand was the implementation of the, the software and that was 53,000. And then we had 10,000 that we used for the ride share uh, program which is uh, the subsidized program with Uber and Lyft. Go ahead. We uh, have just received notice, although we haven't signed the agreement yet, that for uh, July 20, uh, 2020 through January 2021, that they will continue to fund our green line 
um, portion of the, the on-demand software cost and, and still the subsidized ride share. So that's, that'll be good news. It'll be part of the budget coming up. These are just some of the other agencies that also compete for that line 20A funding within Measure J. We also receive funding through the federal government uh, through a program called 5310. It's for uh, small uh, urban areas for uh, senior and disabled transit. We use the funds for capital. Uh, we recently received grant award of uh, four buses. One of them is a, a medium passenger bus for 12 passengers and three of them are 14 passenger. Uh, these will replace existing uh, buses that are over 150,000 miles or over seven years old. So those should arrive sometime in the fall, um, but it's, it's always subject to change when the, the actual contracts and funding become available. But we do have those on the horizon to keep our, our fleet fresh. Uh, this does not impact then our capital uh, budget for vehicles. Uh, they're all, all our current fleet is paid for through this grant funding. So let's move on just to our current uh, situation with the, the COVID-19 impacts. Uh, right when this happened, we reduced to one bus just during the week. We've gradually increased service uh, since. We're back to operating seven days a week with a dial -a bus only. Again, dial -a bus and on-demand are, are somewhat interchangeable. Uh, some of our precautions though, all drivers and passengers must wear a mask. We have reduced capacity to four passengers per bus. Uh, just that way we can maintain social distancing. Uh, our bus filters are clean weekly, our services, surfaces are disinfected after each route, and uh, the buses are actually cleaned professionally on a monthly basis. Go ahead. The services right now is dial -a bus only or on demand. Uh, you have to reserve your ride by calling our dispatch or by using the app, which again, we will be promoting here greatly in the next uh, few weeks. Ride requests must be received 30 to 60 minutes in advance. That's a number we're trying to bring down. We wanna make it closer to 30 minutes. Ride times on the bus is under 15 minutes for local uh, service in the valley or up to 30 minutes for downtown. Again, that's a significant improvement that we wanna promote. Uh, before with fixed route, you could be on the bus up to 40 minutes. So getting that down to 15 minutes uh, is significant. And we also are, are working on and running our subsidized uh, shared ride service with Uber and Lyft. We use a service called GoGo -Go Grandparents. You have to register an account through the bus department to use that. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit here in a second. Go ahead. Our current hours uh, right now, we're going Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. So not quite as late into the evening. Uh, we're running three to four buses in service depending on peak times. So in the early morning, we start off with one bus during peak times, we go up uh, to three to four for a short period while uh, the, the uh, peak hours intersect. And then towards the evening, we, we drop down to one bus again. Uh, same with on the weekends, we're only running 9.30 to five. Once church services get back in session, uh, that will probably increase demand for uh, Sunday buses. Uh, but right now we're just running either two or one bus Go ahead. For our ride sharing services, uh, we're planning on, we were planning on doing a, a full rollout uh, a few months back, but we will be doing that in the near future um, through various, all of our, our opportunities, including uh, the fitness newsletter, website, Rossmore News and, and flyers. 
this shows you just the impacts that COVID has had on our service. We went from in February, over 7,000 rides, dropped significantly in April, uh, but we are building back. So from April, a, a low of 320 to uh, you know, July, we're almost at 1500. August will again reach that, that number. And we look to keep, keep growing that number till we get back to our, our pre COVID numbers. The ride share program through GoGo -Go Grandparents, this was really designed to give residents an opportunity to use a ride share program after hours. So either before we started service or when we close. Uh, previous, we were running service until 8.30 and the service at that time was very, very low. It didn't make sense for us to continue those later hours. So having a ride share program still gives residents an opportunity uh, to be out later, uh, but without using our service. This is again, grant funded. Uh, you register through the uh, bus department, create an account. And when you schedule a ride, uh, the ride is subsidized up to $10, the first $10 of the ride. And then the resident pays the remaining fee. So. You can go to the Oakland Airport if you want. We'll pay $10 and you pay whatever the remaining fee is. Uh, some challenges or concerns we ran into as we were piloting this is the availability of, of drivers on Uber and Lyft to actually come to Rossmore. Uh, through the program, uh, the drivers for especially Uber, they were able to cancel ride requests once they saw where the ride was going. And that was becoming an issue for a while. We've we've been trying to work to resolve that, uh, and then wait times for uh, rides, and also some residents just don't have a cell phone or a, a smartphone to use a ride hailing app. So they we do have the option to call uh, to make a reservation, but you don't see when the bus is going to arrive then, like you would with the cell phone app. Okay, go ahead. We are continuing uh, to do this. Uh, we have several uh, residents that are utilizing it. Uh, more again, as somewhat of a pilot to keep giving us feedback. Um, we're trying to improve the wait times. Also the, the cancellations. It's not a service that if you're going from home to the fitness center, say that you would use because we're, we're likely to get a driver to come from downtown Walnut Creek to make that short uh, trip. It's just not feasible, but uh, we are working to, to make this available. A few more to come on this. Go ahead. That's it. So, Ralph, why don't you undo the share screen and we'll take any questions. So, Jeff, before, before we get to questions, I'd like to hear what you're planning post-COVID. I, I got the impression that uh, maybe it was wrong that uh, somehow you decided to move away from the all on demand and, and keep fixed routes. I mean, obviously downtown will probably stay a fixed route, but let me know, let us know what uh, your plans are for the system post COVID. So having COVID gives us a little bit of an opportunity uh, as, as odd as that sounds to transition to more of the, the on demand uh, initially, when we started talking about it, uh, as you know, change is very difficult for many of our residents. And some of the things they really like about the fixed route is the reliability of it. Um, they know the routes, they know the system. So it provides a lot of comfort. Not having to call and, and schedule a ride every time they have uh, a need. Uh, so there was a lot of benefits to fixed route. Uh, we, we were planning, especially with some of the, the lower performing areas and times to transition more and make more of the on-demand or dial-a-bus available. So we started with one bus replacing the white line. We then had up to two buses. So we were increasing that, that mode while still keeping the uh, fixed routes. With COVID happening and going directly to dial a bus, that gives us more of a chance to get people used to that platform. 
So our plan moving forward through, especially 2021, and you'll, you'll see this in the budget when we present it, is to continue just with the, the dial a bus operation. Uh, and I think that'll be probably the platform we'll continue with from that, that point on. The downtown service likely will be more of a fixed route just because that for efficiency purposes, that, that's a little easier to, to manage. Uh, but you'll see more on demand moving forward. And that's what we're, we're planning on for 2021. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, I, I support all of this that you're, uh, that you're doing. I think it's, it's great. Um, a couple things, couple, a question I have is, um, there was over 7,000 rides before, uh, you know, all, all this started with the COVID. Um, if we had the buses that we have now, and you just had on demand and you had 7,000 rides, um, how, how do you think that that would affect um, it just being, uh, you know, dial a bus? Do you think that it can get to everyone? Considering that now there are times when the bus runs around the route empty, um, but then again, there are other uh, peak times. So how do you and Ralph sort of see how that would go if the ridership moved up to 7,000 and we just had dial a bus? So when the Affair and Pierce did their report, some of the modeling in the report based on on demand, they showed and, and believed that we could increase capacity with on demand style service. Some of that, you know, our experience is, is a little questionable because some of our, our residents take a little bit longer onboarding and offboarding and, and scheduling and so forth. But based on the models and capacity and our, our service area, it looks like we could still maintain that capacity with dial a bus based on what our, our staffing and number of drivers was previous. So 2016 levels. For next year, we anticipate we'll still be under COVID restrictions and, and our capacity on the buses will still be limited to four. So, you know, our ability to reach those same numbers will, will be impacted significantly. We're also not planning on having the same number of buses out on the road as, as we did in the past, uh, at least through 2021. And as demand increases towards 2022, hopefully that we'll see the ability to bring some of that additional service back. The study actually said that we could get the same performance out of fewer buses. So obviously that's just a projection and not reality, but that was what their projection was. And so Jeff, a question about that though. Um, you're saying that uh, you're planning on being under COVID restrictions for the whole year as far as your budget planning for next year? Well, what we're, the level of service that we're planning to, to roll out and as we, we increase, right now we still have some furlough hours that we're dealing with with the, the drivers just based on the level of service we're seeing uh, the demand for. Uh, as we get fewer and fewer restrictions, we think we can grow to the point where we won't have any furlough hours, but we don't think we'll go beyond what our current staffing level is, which is down uh, two positions right now. So uh, I believe we'll be under some kind of restriction or at least capacity wise for at least a majority of the year um, or, or half the year but I believe what we have planned will carry us through all of 2021. So I just downloaded the Tap Ride app, very cool. Uh, but I noticed that UC Davis, UCLA, UC San Diego, I mean, there's a bunch of big users. Have, have we spoken to those folks to see what their experience has been? Ralph, you want to take that? Uh, yeah, through my research, I reached out to several uh, different schools that were using it. Um, our situation is a little more unique than the colleges. The colleges, that was the only transportation they had besides Uber and Lyft. 
That was the only thing they were offering. Um, and it was on a dollar bus service, on demand service, you can call it. Um, so they couldn't maintain uh, the level of requests. So people went right back to Uber and Lyft. So what the schools then did, they changed it to where the buses took them to certain places. So they kind of streamlined the services. They didn't, at first it was open up to anything and anywhere you wanted to go. Now they basically stay on campus. If you want to go off campus, use Uber and Lyft. So that's why when you look at the reviews, it kind of can be a little tainted because that was their experience with all the campuses when they sold it. Um, what I noticed here is that it works for us because it gives us accountability, gives us control. Um, and from, you know, I wasn't a, a, a fan of removing the fixed routes, but the feedback from the residents who popularly use the red line and the blue line, they really enjoy calling now. They, they really do like to direct, you know, it's going to take them instead of 45 minutes on the loop, it's going to take them 25 to stay within the valley. They kind of really like that. One by the way, thing just, we- uh, well, just want to say, by the way, I looked for Rossmore. Um, in that app, and it's not there. It's called Golden Rain. Yeah. Well, everybody calls it Rossmore here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Carl. Yes, I think the other thing is uh, the fixed routes are especially bad when you have to make transfers because you've got to wait for connections, and that has been, I think, a big stumbling block for increased ridership. And I I also think that since we've eliminated the fixed routes and for now because of the COVID crisis, this would be an ideal time to continue this and just not reinstall, reinstate the uh, fixed routes except for the downtown route. Dale? Yes, I, I agree with Carl. I also, because of the um, I would assume that everyone in Rossmore has a telephone. Not everyone has a computer. So obviously the dial a ride is going to be something that we're going to always want to have and need to have. But uh, uh, prior to uh, uh, COVID, um, I took the green line one time and I also used the dial a bus uh, one time and both of those were so, so efficient. Um, they both took the same route, but both efficient. So my congratulations to you, Jeff and Ralph, for the excellent uh, uh, programming that you've done and uh, the excellent work you've done. One thing about the Green Line, I just want to be clear. Right now, because of COVID, um, we're, pick ticking, we're picking people up from their entry to take them downtown. When it was a fixed route, they would all migrate at Gateway, which doesn't really support social distancing. So to continue with the on-demand service now, picking them up from the entry is like a real benefit for the resident. So it answers the question of transferring. Right, exactly. Kathleen? So um, yeah, I, I got the app on my phone and used it once before the COVID thing closed down. And so I'm, uh, I think it's great. And, um, and as people, if it's easy enough to use uh, for people who have smartphones and have used Uber and Lyft or anything like that, it, it would be good. But a telephone uh, for those who aren't comfortable using, and there are a lot here who aren't comfortable using um, you know, their smartphone, I think that's a good idea. So my question is about Uber and Lyft in Rossmore. So I understand that to go out uh, of Rossmore to use a go-go grandparent um, is good because you know you it just it's difficult for us to um, to put anything that goes out. But um, you know you've said before that Uber and Lyft won't come to Rossmore. They don't want it's not worth their time to drive all the way to Rossmore if you're going from your house to Gateway. Uh, or anything like that. So um, what is your plan for, when you would talk about Uber and Lyft in Rossmore um, for something other than buses? Um, you know, Uber and Lyft have residents who do that. So, it, you know, I don't know if it's possible for a, a resident 
and, and uh, Ross Moore to use their car to take people around. Um, uh, I, I know that, that that may not be possible. What, what, what kind of plan is there for something other than just the buses um, to transport people at, at some point in the future? So uh, Uber and Lyft is probably the primary option right now. And currently, if, if you have one of those apps on your phone, you can hail a, a Uber or Lyft vehicle from your residence or anywhere within Rossmore. Through the system that, that we had, because it's it's a dispatch service and not just on your phone, the, when it was assigned to a driver, they were able to see the, the residence and then they, they had the ability to decline the ride, which normally they, they can't do under the normal service. And of course, those, those drivers, they're looking for ways to maximize their revenue and they wanna stay in the high uh, demand areas of downtown and so forth to come out all the way to Rossmore for a very short ride just isn't, it doesn't make them any money. Uh, so there's some issues with it, using it locally. Uh, we are trying to resolve the cancellations with GoGo, uh, but using it to go to downtown or come back to downtown, it, it's a good platform for that. Uh, internally, we were starting to go down the path of the autonomous uh, shuttle options with the, the county. Uh, they have we're anticipating some grant funding and going to pilot a program with us uh, that still may come to pass, but uh, it's, it's been on hold. We haven't heard any new news with that. That may be a, an option. I don't think they would go outside the gate. It's, it's not permitted on public streets yet. Uh, other options are, are the old fashioned taxi uh, type services, but beyond our service of the buses, there isn't a whole lot of, or the public transit uh, through County Connection, there's not a lot of additional options. Well, they did, uh, the, the study did say that it might be more efficient. We could potentially take the savings and expand the hours of our bus service, which would, but all this depends on, or, or is contingent on our services, our meetings, our club meetings and all opening up again, but that, I guess yet to be seen. Why? So Jeff, I, I love all the uh, grant money that you're going for and, and successfully use. The, when I see the vehicle listing, I wonder if if down the road our vehicle specs will change, and and is that something that we could do by the fall of twenty one? Uh, change what we need. That was something we've spent a great deal of time uh, talking about, and you know. The idea of having more of a passenger van uh, that has uh, wheelchair access is is appealing. Uh, under the, the FTA, though, those those vans weren't available, so that really the smallest we had available. It also gives us flexibility. It it gets in and out of the entries fairly easily, but it gives us flexibility when we do the downtown or we do uh, shuttle services, so forth. To meet that capacity but you know at some point we we certainly have looked a lot at the idea of more of a, a passenger van with a, a wheelchair accessible so i just have to question. i understand that some of the people here in rossmore actually work for lyft and uber that they live here that certainly could be we we can't select what individual driver may be assigned to or, or may pick up a ride request uh, or where they are at a time a ride request is made. Uh, so it just, it just depends on how many vehicles are active in the area at a certain time. Kathleen? Um, so, so you mean, and this sort of went back to my question. So someone in Rossmore could be an Uber or Lyft driver and work to take people uh, uh, around, you know, from gateway to their house or, or whatever. So, um, and so, uh, but we don't know if there are anyone who lives in Rossmore who currently has 
So we would not know who those drivers are because they work for Uber or Lyft or whatever service it is. They are uh, an employee or a contractor of Uber and Lyft. Uh, we, we contract with a company called GoGo -Go Grandparents, which will dispatch and, and help people put in the rep ride requests. And then those go out to the various uh, vehicles that are in an area, but we don't know who the driver is until it's assigned. Uh, we don't contract directly with individual drivers at all. Okay, any other, Kathleen and then Neva. Um, but um, I, I do really support the, the vans, if that's uh, possible to work that out in the future. I mean, uh, as far as money, it would be so much more efficient um, if you're going over or around picking up people that you're not driving this 14 passenger bus um, when there's only one person to pick up. Um, but if we had a van that could carry uh, just a few people, that, that would be great. So our, our initial application for Measure J funding in, included uh, a request for a van, but we had to cut back on that because of reduced available funding for Measure J. So that, that is something we want to look at moving forward. Neva and then Dale. Um, if you're going to be using dial -a bus exclusively here, which I think is a good idea. Will the operating hours change in the evenings so that you could take a dial -a bus to a concert at Gateway or at the event center and then come home? Sometimes those concerts don't get over till 9 or 9.15. We have... dial -a bus can accommodate that. So we, we used to have dial a bus uh, several, several years ago available until, uh, geez, I believe it was even 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. And the reality was even with those concerts, people were not using it. Uh, the, the actual numbers were very low. And then we cut back to 8.30 and still the last hour of operation, the, the numbers, to justify the cost of the driver and, and dispatch just doesn't make sense. So that's why we've even dialed back further till to 7.30 now. Um, we have tried to make other things available such as uh, the, the uh, shared ride service with, with through GoGo -Go grandparents, but just limited interest in that. Most people that go to those seem to arrange rides with a neighbor or, or friend. Dale? Yeah, Jeff, um, would you anticipate uh, after all of this is over and you don't really have to limit uh, to four, dry, uh, four passengers, would you anticipate that you might just gradually increase the number because of people being really super cautious after all of this? Well, I, I don't know that we're going to have a lot beyond the green line going downtown. A lot of demand that will have to go over for passengers anyway. Uh, keep in mind that within the valley, the more passengers you have on the bus, it means the more stops you're making between pickups and then your ride times become longer and it becomes then less convenient and it's transit is a real public transit is a real balancing act between convenience cost uh, and you know, the more convenient it is, the more it costs, the more people like it, but the more cost. So uh, we're trying to find that balancing point. So I doubt you'll see more than four people on a bus, but you, you know, we'll have that ability. Any other questions, uh, Jeff and Rob? Okay, thank you guys, and um, I look forward to, so you're going to be promoting this app then, because I, I still have the old TransLock. I should get rid of that, you're saying then, and, and download should, somewhere. Huh? You should get rid of that. We definitely will be doing more of a rollout of uh, the app and the, the services on the website and uh, other options, newspaper and so forth. Great. 
Okay, thank you. Hi. Tough times for re-envisioning the bus service, but you guys are doing a good job. Thank you. Yes, and when we get the app, uh, maybe people should try um, just uh, going for a ride on it just to see what using the app is like. And give, it, give us your feedback. Yes. Uh, that's, that's how we keep in improving. You know, contact uh, Ralph or myself. Uh, we need to keep hearing that feedback on you know, ease of use, where it struggles, um, so we can keep tweaking things. If any of the board members want to call me directly and I'll help you set up your phone, um, I can do that for you real easy over the phone. Great. Thank you. Okay, guys. So we have one more agenda item. Uh, the goals. We have about 15 minutes before we hit the 90 minute mark where we usually take breaks. Do you want to power through the goals or do you want to take a break early, come back for the goal, and then we'll have another break before our executive session. So preferences? Carl? Yeah, so I have to set up a system for my wife. So I would prefer we have one longer break after the whole thing. Okay. Anyone else have a preference? Kathleen? I think we can just go through the goals. I mean, uh, if, if everyone else is okay, and then, uh, and then have a, a break before the executive session. Okay. That's what we'll do then. So moving on to the goals, we had three goals, um, proposed uh, board goals. We, we did um, minimize the number of goals this year because of COVID and all the other uh, work going on for staff. And so uh, the first one of those is uh, dealing with the charters, uh, possibly changing the charters to insert term limits uh, into the committee charters uh, as a potential goal. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts about that? You've reviewed the way that was set up, um, proposed, Ken? Yeah, I, uh, I've got we've got it on the agenda about the uh, charter, about the member committee term limits and whatnot. But it, the reading seems to indicate that the policy committee is supposed to study all the committee charters in their entirety, or just cons as it refers to term limits. Well, I think no, the, just in, as it refers to term limits, and that the, each committee would be. Uh, we would be asking for opinions from the committees, but we would be looking at it sort of uh, having an overview over the idea and considering that from the perspective of all. Very good. <laughs> Sue? I really support very much having term limits. Uh, with a caveat to that is you could you could have two, three-year term limits like we do with the Golden Rain or First Mutual. And then if a person stayed out for a term, if you're having trouble getting people to come back in, they can try it again. Um, but have at least the opportunity to get new ideas and new blood in. Um, so I think two, uh, three-year terms is uh, really the max. And, and if I think you could have them stay out for a term and then possibly come back if they want to. Carl and then Kathleen. Yes, I think that the exception to term limit should probably be the lack of people volunteering. If no one is volunteering to fill the position, people can go for extended uh, time. But if there's new blood willing to serve on the committee, it should take priority over exemptions to term limits. Kathleen? So uh, I understood that we're not supposed to decide this, but this would be a goal for each of the committees to look at and decide for themselves. So we don't need to have a discussion about whether there should be term limits for each of the committees. It's up to the committees to do that. It, am I not correct in that? Yeah, no, this is, a, this is a goal for GRF. This is not each committee making a decision. This would be something GRF would would uh, put into the uh, policy, the uh, policies. Um, so, so we're, so we're making the decision today about th that. No, we're we're making a decision about whether this is a goal, and then it'll be discussed and evaluated. Um, okay. Tim and then Dale. And uh, you you have already approved the goals. 
what you asked us to, that was last month. So what you're doing this time is the attachments that you asked us to do was to kind of reformulate the goal with objectives and timelines, put them in the smart goal format. So in your packet, you have the objectives that have been identified for each goal. So um, all you're doing today is confirming that because you've already done, you've already adopted the goals. You don't have to re-debate the goals. You've already adopted that last month. So just confirming that the objectives that we've outlined are consistent with what your intentions are. That's really what you're doing here today. Dale and then Carl. Well, I, I don't know. My comment's going to fit in then with what Tim just said, but I support what Carl said because it is conceivable that we might have uh, a situation where uh, there isn't anyone that is really suitable or interested. Um, and so uh, a person maybe just needs to be off for one year and can be considered then uh, to come back on. Well, the policy committee will be coming up, I think, with the specific language and and there will oh. be some exceptions, I think, and okay. we don't have applicants. So Carl and then Kathleen and then Dwight. You know, one, one other thing I think we ought to consider is the ending term for committees, because right now we have committees ending and then a gap before the committee is reformed. And in our situation where we wanted committee input during the COVID thing, uh, we were stuck with uh, essentially unmanned committees. And I think that another thing we ought to do is establish that the committee, even though there aren't people necessarily, that the committee term actually ends with the reappointment of the new committee members. Okay, that's something we can consider, Kathleen, and then Dwight. Okay, so for the this goal, the first objective is uh, what is to be done: review and evaluate the planning uh, at the planning committee the current methods GRF uses to communicate with residents. Uh, wait a minute, am I on the wrong one? Yeah, you're on the wrong one. Yeah, sorry. Um, okay. So the first objective is uh, what is to be done? Review and evaluate the policy committee, uh, whether term limits should be appropriate. And how is this to be measured completion of review by committee? And it's to be done by uh, October, 2020. So I think that's a fine objective. Uh, so I agree with that. And objective two is what is to be done? Uh, proposed modifications, if any, to resident committee charters. Uh, and the draft charter is completed, and this is to be done by December of 2020. I think that's fine. Objective three, what is to be done? Obtain input from any, any committee whose charters are proposed to be modified. Um, and um, that's to be measured by submission of charter drafts to the resident committee, and this is to be done by February, objective four is what is to be done, obtain approval from board for any changes to the prospective committee charters. And that is to be done by March of 2021. So I think the objectives are fine. And um, so if that's what, according to Tim, we're supposed to do today, I think we, I propose that we um, approve the objectives for the, um, uh, for this goal, which is to review the committee charters. Is there a second? I second. Okay, then Dwight, you had some your hand up before. So I don't think we need to read these aloud. I read them all in advance and I have no problem with all three smart uh, documents. And uh, maybe you could amend your uh, motion to approve all three. Uh, yes, without reading them, uh, I agree with that. We can, <laughs> we can approve all three. I changed my second to uh, uh, approve all three. I guess my, my question is about the bus service though. I mean, it, is it even necessary to keep that in there? It sounds like we're sort of moving along. Is that really pertinent to remain a board goal? There's no problem with achieving a goal early. Okay. 
Okay, so we have a, a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, let's have a vote. Elsa. Yes. Stumpfell. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Walker. Yes. Adams. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Brown. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Bakuchi. Yes. Okay, passes unanimously. I think that takes care of our business except for announcements. The annual joint meeting of the Board of Directors and the Finance Committee will be held on Tuesday, September 15th and Wednesday, September 16th at 9 a.m. Uh, via Zoom. Uh, so we'll be discussing the 2021 budget then. The next end of month regular meeting of the board will be held September 24th at 9 a.m. via Zoom uh, meeting as well. Uh, we'll be in recess for executive session uh, get together as one o'clock. Okay, it's a little less. Well, is that two? Two? Uh, you want to do one or one ten? One ten. One ten. Neva wants one ten. Yes. Okay, one ten. Uh, we'll meet back. Uh, also, a reminder that the executive session is. Uh, to be confidential. So make sure you're in a place where there aren't other people around or you can close the doors and, and maintain conf confidentiality. Okay, see you at 110.